Okay, good morning members and uh, you're very welcome to this morning's meeting of the Health Committee. Um, I declare the meeting now open to the public online. So I'd like to welcome now all members who are participating online by video conference today, which is myself, Pam Cameron, Paula Bradshaw, Jerry Carroll, Orlea Flynn and Pat Sheehan. And can I remind all members about the protocols regarding electronic devices? Um, so just just as both members to uh, to re reflect on the ongoing very very difficult situation in terms of COVID nineteen, the ongoing serious pressures on hospital staff, and the need to uh, for to ask members of the public to reinforce that messaging that uh, that we're in in a very serious situation with uh, levels of spread of the virus at the present time. Um, I also want to advise members. There's a, a, we will be having a change of clerk, and I'd like to introduce now Keith McBride, who will be transitioning into the role, um, and he will be formally taking over from the 1st of February. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, also thank Eilish Hohe for the very significant work that she has put into this committee over a very, very long period of time. Very professional, has been very, very supportive to all members and to me personally. And uh, I want to wish Eilish all the very best in the next stage of, of her career. And uh, just to say that that where she's going, we'll be very, very lucky to have her in the sense of a very, very capable, very, very capable and diligent um, person. So thank you for that, Eilish. Um, so I also advise members and uh, that all, all meetings are fully virtual now, given the situation that we're in, and um, would members be content to do that again next week if, if, we can, if we can manage to have this fully virtual, that in the interest of safety, we will have this again next week. Are members content with that? Thank you, members. Moving on then, members, to the draft minutes. I refer you, members, to uh, your meeting pack there at tab 3.1. Um, are members content with those minutes? Yeah, members content. Thank you. And there are no members, no matters arising from the minutes there today, members. So moving on then, um, I refer you now, members, to tab five of your pack and also tab five of your table papers. I can advise you, members, that the chief executives from three of the trusts are here today to update the committee on the, their trust response to the pandemic. So I'd now like to welcome by video link Mr. Sean Devlin, who is Chief Executive of the Southern Trust, uh, Dr. Cathy Jack, who is Chief Executive of the Belfast Trust, and Miss Jennifer Welsh, who is Chief Executive of the Northern Trust. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, so now, so good morning, Shane, um, Jennifer, and Cathy. Uh, good to see, well, in, in Shane and Cathy again, I, have, I've, I haven't uh, met with you, Jennifer, in person, but delighted to have you here this morning, I have to say, appreciate you being uh, at the committee and answering questions from committee members, particularly given the pressure that we know each and every one of you are under. Your, your, your senior team and the frontline staff are all under tremendous pressure, um, so, so we do um, appreciate you, you being here this morning. We have Could lost I, your audio, Chair. Could I ask Broadcasting to bring Colm Gildernew back into the spotlight, please? Okay, chair, okay just chair. checking. Can you, can you hear me now again, uh, Shane and company? Yes. Yeah, chair. Okay. Okay. Did uh, so. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure where I lost you, but just to reiterate the fact that we welcome your attendance today at the committee. We very much understand as a committee the pressure that, that all of you are under, that uh, your senior teams and your frontline staff are under day and daily coping with this pandemic. And that has been continuous now over a long period of time. So my understanding is I think that Jennifer is going to um, um, lead off with remarks. If we, we'll, we'll take those remarks from Jennifer. And then in the interest of just a facilitating the question and answer session. If I could ask each of you, if, if one of you could give a sort of a principal answer or, or indeed the sole answer to the question, and if the others then have anything additional, if, or if necessary to add, uh, so be it. But rather than, I suppose, rather than getting three answers, I suppose we'll, we'll try to keep it kind of, where, where that works, I understand your three different trusts and that may, so you may have other things to add and that's fine as well. Okay, thank you. So I will, uh, I will, 
Yep, I'll go ahead and invite Jennifer to make your opening remarks. Go ahead, Jennifer, please. Thank you. Okay, Chair, thank you. Um, we're all delighted to be here uh, this morning and, and uh, thank you for the time. Um, you'll have received information for, from us in terms of uh, the joint introduction and then a brief from each of the different organisations. Um, I did want to mention that, as you'll be aware, the Trust Chief Executive did, did take the unusual or seldom used step of uh, publishing two statements, one in mid-December and one uh, on the 10th of January, indicating our concern at the level of community transmission of COVID-19, the pressure to date within the entire health and social care system, and the anticipated first, third, third, of course, which we are we now find ourselves in. Um, all of the modelling projections indicated that we would see this particular surge now within the third week of the pandemic, and those projections have been of enormous benefit to all of the trusts as we have prepared our surge plans but with the emphasis on flexibility and agility to be able to deal with the issues that actually evolve on the ground. Uh, we've provided you with a number of graphs. Uh, the first graph gives you the confirmed COVID-19 daily admissions across all. And that's useful because in comparison to the earlier two surges. And I think it's important to note as well uh, in terms of the second wave, which took place really through October and November, it didn't come right back down to baseline. So we went into a third surge already at a very high level of activity right across the health and social care system, which adds to the pressure. Uh, graph two shows the COVID-19 positive cases in the last seven days per 100,000 of the population and broken down by coastal district. Um, and Coming in, commenting later on, there has been particular pressure, as you can see there, in the Southern Trust area. That continues. There's a little bit of concern that I have now from a qualified perspective. And obviously, um, that... Sorry, Jennifer. Right. Jennifer, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult... I can hear you reasonably well, but other members are struggling to hear you. I'm wondering, can you um, speak up a little, please? Or possibly, if you had if earphones or headphones or something like that, or turn up your volume if you can. Thank you. Okay, I've turned the volume up. Is that helpful? Okay, go ahead and we'll see how that works out. So I was talking about graph two, which is the one that shows the new positive cases broken down by coastal district. Uh, and really just showing the variation across the region with different postcodes showing different intensity in terms of the number of different COVID positive cases. Uh, we've seen obviously particular pressure uh, for Shane in the Southern Trust area. I myself am somewhat concerned now about what we're seeing uh, up in the North Coast in the Causeway area. And as we all know, it's those high levels of community transmission that later translate into pressure on our emergency departments, our medical wards, our enhanced response, and then later into our intensive as well. Of positive inpatients at midnight. That was the position on Sunday night. Uh, and again, you can see the steep rise as we moved into January and the third surge. Graph four and graph five both show that over the last few months, Belfast and Northern Trusts have been particularly under pressure. They're in blue and orange lines. And certainly for myself and the Northern Trust, we've seen a steady rise in COVID 19 inpatient numbers right since October. But you can see the as we've moved into January and also when it starts to reduce again which shows you the level of transfer of patients across the region away from Daisy Hill and Craig Avon to really try and ease the pressures on that site but I think it's quite interesting Chair, that you happen to have asked the three of us here today the three of us in our respective trusts are certainly experiencing the heavy load in terms of the total number of COVID positive inpatients. And we can see that very clearly uh, from graph four and graph five. Um, all of us have worked very hard and have prepared and enacted our surge plans. And that included doubling the ICU capacity at each district general hospital, including Gavin, and also, of course, standing up to the United Hospital Hospital and Surge Capital. We also have the regional White Abbey Rehabilitation Nightingale Hospital, which is remember, playing an important role around the rehabilitation of the community. We do have very high numbers of people requiring that enhanced respiratory support and intensive care. 
and all of us have had no option but to redeploy skilled staff from other areas, particularly on staff to meet the requirements of these cities patients. And that impacted on our ability to perform the normal electric work that we would be doing, including cancer and other time critical surgery. Chair. Chair, can you still hear me? Um, perhaps I can advise the witnesses that the room can't hear you uh, very well at all. Um, Jennifer, if you could try a headset, that would be helpful. And we'll just, we'll just hold on for you if, if that's possible. I'll have to try and get a headset. <laughs> just bear with me, please. Can I just check that the chair can hear us and be heard in the room? We can't hear you, chair, at all. Are you hearing me now, Eilish? Yes, we Victor? are. Yeah, we're hearing you now. Yes. Uh, could we, we, could, we could suspend there maybe for a few moments to allow Jennifer to get access to a headset. So we suspend the meeting. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Thank you. 
Okay, members, thank you. And hopefully now we are back on uh, on our session. And so let's see if that has improved the quality of the sound. Could you re resume there again, Jennifer, please? Do we see how, how, that, how this works now? Thank you. Yes, can everybody hear me okay now? Um, I'm hearing you. It's still quite faint, but it's it's uh, a bit clearer. But it, it's a, yeah. Try that now, Jennifer. Again. You close the door there. Up somewhat as well. Is that better? Yes, I think that's better. Um, can I check with members? Are you hearing Jennifer any better there at this point? Um, Clark, are you hearing Jennifer in the room? I think so. Uh, we, we didn't hear enough there to be sure, but uh, sure. Okay. Okay, Jennifer, go go ahead, please, and we'll we'll uh, we'll see how it's going as you as you go through your presentation. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure where you were able to hear to. I'll just pick up at graphs four and five because I think those are that's quite important actually. Um, where we've seen the Belfast and Northern Trust under particular pressure for quite some time. Um, at a steady rise of COVID patients really from right since October. And then the Southern Trust area has seen a very, a very significant rise, uh, steeper than the other trusts, for instance, around the 6th of January, reflecting the greater community transmission in those particular council areas. Uh, and I had commented earlier, I thought it was quite interesting that it happened to be the three of us here today, where the three trust areas certainly carrying the biggest load in terms of the, the number of COVID positive inpatients. We have all prepared and enacted our surge plans, which has included doubling the ICU capacity at each district general hospital, including Antrim and Craig Avon, and of course, standing up the regional intensive care unit at Nightingale at Belfast City. We also have the regional rehabilitation White Abbey, uh, White Abbey Nightingale Hospital, which opened uh, to patients in November. We have high numbers of patients requiring enhanced respiratory support and intensive care, and therefore we had no option but to redeploy skilled staff from other areas, particularly theatre staff, to meet the requirements of those sickest patients. And that has seriously impacted on the ability, our ability to perform our normal work, including cancer and other time critical surgery. And that's not a situation uh, that any of us wish to see. But what I would want to assure members is that our entire health and social care system is working together like never before. Urgent surgery, including cancer, is one area where we have and we will continue to prioritise those who are most in need. And we will allocate precious surgical slots accordingly as a region. And trusts have also worked together to transfer patients across hospitals to best manage the demand within the regional resource that's available, whether that's staffing or beds or oxygen. Um, in relation to all of our staff, all of them have performed incredibly, and we believe that society as a whole can be really proud of them for what they've had to contend with over a very long period of time. They have gone well beyond what any of us could have reasonably expected of them. But staffing pressures do remain a significant challenge. We have pre-existing staffing pressures which are well rehearsed, and when we add COVID-19 and other absence into that, it creates a position which is far from comfortable, particularly given the current situation. Approximately 10% of all health and social care staff are currently absent from work. That includes those who are required to self-isolate. In terms of vaccination, uh, the COVID-19 vaccines have provided much needed hope. And at the time this document was written, almost 150,000 vaccines had been administered to residents and staff of care homes, to health and social care staff, and to the over 80s. So in summary, Chair, all of our trust services remain under significant pressure. Uh, we have seen further rises in ICU admissions this week, and we expect more. All trusts are and will continue to work together to best manage this surge, but also to ensure that resources are used to best effect as we emerge from the current high pressure situation. We all welcome this reduction in the new positive cases, but it's certainly not a time for complacency. And it's clear that a return to normal is still some way off. So the hope that we're seeing from the vaccination programme must go hand in hand with the necessary precautions in terms of public behaviour and compliance with the restrictions. I'll pause there, Chair. You also have the individual brief from each organisation. Uh, and as you say, we'll, we'll feed questions accordingly. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, whichever of Shane and Cathy then is, is uh, go, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah, Shane. 
No, no, uh, um, no, please, after Kathy. Go ahead, Kathy. Just to say, um, Jennifer prevents, presents a really clear picture in, in Belfast. Our staff absence would be over 12%. Um, given the COVID, we have had a reduction in COVID absence from the first surge to now, but we still have many that are isolating because they have been tracked and, and traced. Um, so that continues uh, to put us under strain. Today in my organisation, I have 210 COVID positive inpatients within 14 days, but I have an additional 50 which have remained in hospital beyond 14 days because they have much more complex needs and their length of stay, as Jennifer has said before, uh, is nearly double that of a normal uh, average patient in the winter time uh, with a medical illness. Um, we have 32 patients on CPAP. I have nine of those actually actively being monitored by our ICU team. Uh, and I have 30 uh, COVID positive patients in ICU, 27 in the Nightingale, but three in the regional ICU because they've come in with other issues and they need the specialist regional care, but they also have COVID. I, I have 17 homes on escalation, which is four in red uh, and two receiving mutual aid. So we continue to be under significant pressure across our services. And indeed I have a number, a very small number of children uh, who have been admitted with illnesses who also have COVID in the children's hospital today and a small number of looked after children in our care with COVID positive. That's my situation. Over to Shane. Thank you, Cathy. Um, and as Jennifer and, and Cathy have said, we're all under extreme pressure. As Jennifer had indicated, uh, we had a considerable shift in the last four to five weeks in the Southern Trust area. Uh, particularly given our community transmission rate, both the Armagh, Bambridge, Craigavon district, Mid Ulster, and also Newry, Morn and Down, were the three highest community uh, transmission rates, the highest infection rates. At some point, some of our postcodes were up to nearly 1,500 positive cases per 100,000, which resulted in having an enormous growth we moved from a top position in our first surge of 63 inpatients to last week having 272 inpatients uh, who were COVID positive. Now, we have over the last week been able to reduce that number primarily because the whole system has been working together and a number of our patients from the Southern area ended up becoming patients of both the Belfast Trust and also the Southeastern Trust as well, um, which allowed us to manage. We are still in excess of 200 uh, COVID positive inpatients today. That is a much better picture than we were this time last week because the region is working collectively as a region to make sure we can keep patients safe. So that for us, I mean, our, our position is very similar to Belfast in the north. Our populations have had very high, very, very high viral position. Um, but clearly what we're managing to do is manage a huge number of inpatients way far over and above anything we'd ever imagined we would do. Um, and that has resulted in our beds being exceptionally busy, but also in our case, our ICU being close to full with 14 out of 16 today. Um, and every trust is feeling that as well. And again, approaching a regional approach to ICU as well. So we're looking across all the five trusts and how we can best use the assets across all five trusts. Much like the Belfast in the North, we too are having considerable staff absence. So today we have 759 staff not at work because of COVID. Now that of course does not mean they are all COVID positive, but it does mean that they are either COVID positive or isolating. And 759 out of any workforce is a huge number, which puts additional pressure on staff who are already um, exhausted. Um, and I think that's our single biggest challenge moving forward is the workforce, how we can support our workforce in what is now month 11 of, of this pandemic. So I'll leave it there, Chair. Very happy to take questions, all three of us are.
Okay, thank you. Thank you to each of you. And uh, thank you for, for uh, Jennifer for that overview. Um, and very, very uh, worrying, worrying still. I suppose my first question would be in relation to how you plan and the planning models that you're that you're utilizing. Um, and I know that that there are other factors such as staff absences, which which would impact on that planning model. But how do you use how do you get a baseline for where you expect to be next week, the week after, or indeed where, say, for example, on that weekend when Southwest Acute had to start bringing in people from, and, and, and luckily was there to bring in people from other areas, but um, is the planning sufficiently robust or is the planning um, something that is very difficult for you to manage as, as chief executives? Yeah, Shane? Do you want me to take the lead on, on, on that one? So, Chair, we have um, a forecasting model. That model is worked through with the Chief Scientific Officer, the CMO, and our own informatics professionals at trust level. And that forecasting model looks at a range of factors which enables us to forecast. Now, it's not a prediction, it's not, a, it's not perfect, but it's a forecasting model. That allows us to understand the number of patients we would expect to be inpatients, the number of patients we would expect to be in ICU. And that allows us to put our surge plans together based on the number of beds we would need, based on the understanding of how long a COVID positive patient stays in hospital, et cetera. So that allows us to build a picture of what we may need. The challenge isn't the picture of what we may need. The challenge is meeting that need, given the fact that our resources are in fact limited. And, and I don't mean that in any kind of negative form. We have a fixed resource. That fixed resource is our, our capacity in our buildings and our staff. So we would take an understanding of the uh, projections. We would look at what we need, and then we would best model to meet that need. But it, we must stress the limiting factor in that model is the availability of staff because if you take for example i know that my model says how many icu beds i need therefore i need to increase my icu capacity to meet that need that means i am taking staff from other parts of my trust to to enable icu to grow and as a result that may mean there are other things i can't do so that's how we plan we look at what the demand is going to be we look at what we need to meet that demand and then we plan against it but we do not have an endless capacity and therefore we have to make choices. And, and you refer to the Southwest acute situation two weekends ago when it was myself as chief executive of the Southern Trust spoke to all of my trust chief executive colleagues to, to Anne from the West and to Kathy, et cetera, to say that the numbers of patients we have have exceeded our modeling expectations, exceeded our capacity. And as a result, we need support to enable us to move some of our patients to other trusts to provide a safe service. And therefore, it's not just about the Southern Trust looking after Southern Trust patients, but it's about all trusts looking after all patients. But I must stress, Chair, no matter how much planning we do, we are limited by the capacity that we have to meet this demand. And the pandemic demand in this particular surge, in surge three, is quite enormous compared to the pandemic demand in surge one. So I'm more than happy to ask Jennifer and Kathy to, to come on on top of that, but that's primarily how we work it. We look at the surge, we look at the demand, and then we build our plans around that. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you, Chair. The only thing that I would add is that we also try and remain fairly flexible and agile. You want to be able to stay just ahead of the pandemic so that you're not shutting down services too quickly. So we have tried to maintain all of our urgent and cancer surgery for as long as we possibly can, only stepping back at the last minute whenever we have to transfer those resources into intensive care. So, so it's, it's really working this on a daily basis to make sure that you're staying just ahead. And also when, it, when the right time comes to be able to de-escalate quickly as well, so that we can turn services back on in a timely manner as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead, Cathy. Just to say, I, I know in my modeling that I needed to have 290 medical beds for COVID patients, but we also knew because my oxygen supply, my infrastructure was better that we may be asked to take 
some patients that needed high flow oxygen because ERVO is up to maybe three to six times the amount of oxygen you'd use if you were a ventilator. So I think that was one of the issues that actually Southern Trust struggled with through no fault of their own. You can see on the graph, they had a huge peak in their admissions reflected because of their community transmission. And we were ready. So my plan actually has some additional beds to try and cope with that greater Belfast flow, which would be right and proper. And actually we really need to work as a system because you can see from Jennifer, from the graphs across, the community transmission is not equitable across Northern Ireland. So the whole system working is so important here. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for that. And then uh, my, my, my second and final question before I go to members is in relation to the vaccination, and you had mentioned there um, in your presentation that uh, I, the, there's been high levels of vaccination rolled out across uh, residents and staff and care homes and staff. But what about, what about inpatient, over 80 inpatients in the hospital? We're picking up significant concern that there is no vaccination or appears to be very little vaccination taking place in hospital of people who are over 80. And that's, that's people who are still inpatient and also people who are being discharged to home where they will be encountering you know, a great deal of cure in relation to their, their condition and potential vulnerabilities around that. So what is the situation with vaccinations in hospitals at the present time? Thank you. Can I come in for that, Shane and Jennifer, you content? Just to say, we very much follow the policy decisions through the Department of Health, but I think it's very important to note that the Pfizer vaccine that we are being given from trusts has very tight regulation around it, which includes the number of times it can be transported. And currently there is no system that we could take the Pfizer vaccine from ward to ward without significant wastage. The second factor is that people in our hospitals are currently sick. And actually it is not good to vaccinate people who are unwell with intercurrent illness. And you will know that from the flu data out there and people that have COVID should not be vaccinated until a month after their recovery because their risk of side effects is greater. So we are not currently vaccinating them. We are currently looking at some of the clinically extremely vulnerable who may use our services as an outpatient, such as dialysis patients, but that discussion is going on with the Department of Health because they are currently well, but coming in or could come into the vaccination centre and be vaccinated. So that is the reason why it's not individuals who you might have two in this ward and three in the other, you could not carry the vial. And just so you know, Colm, for me, we have, we have actually delivered over 27,000 vaccinations. Our wastage is 66 doses, which has largely been the care homes because we could not transport that vaccine back because it's not safe to do so. Our wastage is less than 0.25%. This is a really scarce resource. We need to use it wisely. We are in discussion. We will get as many people vaccinated as soon as we can. Absolutely, that is our commitment. Okay, thank you. So I will go then, first of all, to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, and then I'll be going to Paula and our Leah. Um, so go ahead, Pam, with your question, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, huge appreciation of thanks for your attendance today, um, Kathy, Jennifer, and Shane. Good to see you all again. Um, I have a few questions here. Um, I wanted to kick off. Um, I'll maybe just fire them at you so that the relevant person can answer them and try and get as many um, answers as possible. Um, the first one will be on the back of a conversation with uh, the BMA yesterday. You'll be well aware of the concern around the, um, the second dose of the vaccine being delayed for healthcare staff. And I'm just wanting to know whether whether you sympathise with their position, uh, whether you're concerned um, that th there may be a continuation of staff absence because of um, contracting COVID, given that, and the, the figures I was given yesterday were that 
you know, the first dose was offering 52% protection uh, maximum and only 33% over the age of 60. But yet uh, in that over 60 bracket, that, that goes up to 98% protection. Um, after the second dose for the over 60. So uh, if, I'm just wanting if you, to know if you have a, a, a comment around that. And then I also wanted to ask you around um, whether you're expecting to breach your capacity of ICU within the next day or two. And I wanted to hear from you to hear what your reaction is to the, the military assistance, which has been announced, um, and also that un unison statement, which was released last night. Um, and then um, my, my final question would be to ask you if you have statistics that you could provide us here today at committee around the age groups of those who are being admitted with COVID symptoms to your hospitals and what is your message to the public right now? Thank you. Okay, and I'll go back to the panel then to pick up on those questions, please. I am more than happy to start with a couple of those and then move on to other people if that would be helpful, if, if that's okay. So I'll, in terms of the, the second dose, if I take that, and maybe Jennifer, you talk about ICU capacity and, and, and Kathy, the military, if that's okay. So in terms of the second dose, I think it, it's very clear uh, the government policy, both SAGE, the independent SAGE, the four countries, the four CMOs, um, took a view that the best thing and the right thing to do was to provide the vaccine to as many people as is possible across Northern Ireland, and therefore, we, and the JVCI guidance as well. So it's very clear we are following the guidance. I appreciate that there are different views. And I really do appreciate there are different views. And I appreciate that recent papers from Israel and, and the Guardian newspaper yesterday, et cetera, I appreciate there are different views. But in terms of SAGE, alternative SAGE, the four, the four, count, four governments, the CMOs, um, that is the direction, that is government policy. Um, and so far, I'm proud to say we have vaccinated 19,500 people in the Southern Trust following that, that guidance. Um, and we will continue to do so. So um, I think it's very clear we're following policy and, and we are delivering a huge amount of vaccine. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to others to come in and, and maybe Jennifer, the ICU capacity question. Yes, um, thanks Shane, thank you Chair. Yes, in relation to the ICU capacity, um, I am confident that we will be able to uh, support all of those who need intensive care uh, to get that. I think the issue for us is where the capacity might be. We have worked very hard to deliver both a local escalation and a regional escalation. So every district general hospital, every big hospital outside uh, of Belfast has doubled its ICU capacity. So for example, normally in Antrim, we only have seven intensive care unit beds. We have been able to go up to 14. Shane is the same, going up to 16 and so on. Um, so we have all agreed that each trust outside of Belfast would locally escalate to a particular level. And then beyond that, it's only the regional ICU Nightingale uh, in the city hospital with Cathy that would proceed on up at the later layers of escalation. We have always worked together as part of a critical care network. So patients are moved around. If one unit is becoming under significant pressure, there is a, a, an, a, an arrangement through NYSTAR, which is the Northern Ireland Specialist Transport and Retrieval Service, uh, where those very sick patients are, are transported while ventilated. Uh, so it's a really expert service. They're well used to doing this. So I'm confident uh, that we will have the capacity, but it may be that we have to transfer people to where that capacity exists. Maybe I could just come in on yeah. behalf of the, the Nightingale there and then the, the ICU, and then I'll, I'll take the military assistance. So just, just to say that in Belfast, as you know, we have a number of different ICUs normally. We have the cardiac ICU and then the regional ICU, but then we have two of our local ICUs in the matter and the city. Uh, between the matter and the city, we usually have 10.5 beds. We have the ability and, and currently our staff for 32 beds. So of those at the moment, as you know, 27 are full today, but I have five empty beds. After that, I also have the staff identified, named 
and trained to, to staff the first two pods from Belfast's point of view. So I, like Jennifer, am absolutely confident today that I have the ability to look after the number of patients that require ICU over the next week to 10 days. Moving on then to the military question, can I just be very clear? My priority is to provide safe, effective and compassionate care to as many patients as possible and indeed to support my staff to do so. And I am very proud of the care and compassion that my staff have delivered to patients to date throughout this pandemic. Retirees, students and volunteers have all come in to help us and we have welcomed them. This is another group of highly trained individuals which will help us to deliver the care that we need to do. They are band four equivalent staffs. They are medically trained technicians. They're able to take blood, put in venflons, and they will be working under our normal management structures. And for me in Belfast, they will be focusing on helping to support the regional Nightingale. So today I've had 80 third and fourth year medical students. I have another 170 of those that have applied for the church three, and I've had 177 uh, nursing students that have come in to help us. We had medical graduates that started two months early to help us in the first surge. This is another group of highly trained individuals that will support my staff to support the patients and deliver the care they need. And I welcome this. Can I just come back on that, Chair? Um, thank you all for your, your thank answers. You, very, yes, uh, very, very welcome answers. Thank you for that. And I should have said at the start, just to put on record my appreciation for the incredible work um, all three of you are doing and your, your team of staff around you and indeed every healthcare worker within the system. Um, I don't think we could ever be more proud of you all. So I just want to thank you for all that you've done in this past year and continue to do. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going then across to our Paula. Paula Bracha, go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, panel, and thank you so much for coming. I very much would I'll echo what Pam has just said there in terms of appreciation. My first question is in relation to the growing evidence and the warnings around the potential risk um, of COVID-19 patients developing ME. Um, a lot of the symptoms you'll be aware are very, very similar, but unfortunately the recruitment process for the ME clinical lead is now I think, into nine years without anybody in post. So I would like you to comment on the longer um, on, on the plans to actually deal with long COVID in your trust, but also that very specific issue around the regional services for ME. Thank you. Shane, Jennifer, do you want me to take that? Um, just to say, Paula, you raise a very important question. And can I just put that in context? I think yesterday the Department of Health said there's 1,671 people that died of COVID in the last 11 months. That's approximately 40 deaths a day. So it is a killer disease. Uh, having said that, um, what isn't being reported is the effect of long-term COVID, of cardiac problems, of clotting problems, of stroke, um, of respiratory problems. And then of course, the other, what we call now long COVID. Uh, and there'll be a huge morbidity that I think we need to be ready for. From the point of view of, of Belfast, we try and follow up patients who've been in the ICU. We are, have a, Belf, a business case to look at this uh, long COVID condition. I think it is separate to um, ME. You are right, uh, since a couple of individuals retired, the service has struggled to get off the ground. That isn't because of commissioning, it has been commissioned. People have, we've gone out to try and recruit, but I understand we have not yet appointed, but it is something that is on our radar. But I do think we will have actually quite significant morbidity from COVID, which will need to be recognized, planned and commissioned for as we go forward. But we are already working in that space and it will require a multidisciplinary team to actually manage these patients and make sure that they can recover to their maximum. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, the second question is in relation, <clears throat> excuse me, to the postponed cancer surgery, and I'm just wondering if there's any update, even in terms of communicating with those people who've been affected. Um, they all the MLAs are the same in terms of getting correspondence of people who are incredibly anxious about the potential spread of the condition. Thank you. I mean, I I can certainly start, and, and I'm sure Jennifer want to come in as well. 
I mean, obviously, we are hugely sorry for what we have had to do with regards to the downturn of cancer services and surgery in many cases. Um, and as a result, we are aware that that is causing pain and anxiety. And as I say, that isn't something that anyone in our role takes lightly. The difficulty, of course, is that the more community infection, the more people come to hospital, and as a result, the more services we have to support for COVID. And primarily, if I can give you an example, to, to escalate our ICU to the stage we're at now, I need 170 staff. And those 170 staff have to come from other parts of our service and primarily as anesthetics and theatre staffing, which has resulted in us unable to provide surgery uh, for those patients. In addition, of course, um, many surgeries will need an ICU bed on standby ready for the patient as well. So there is no doubt this has caused us to have to cancel considerably urgent and cancer services. At the moment, I cannot until I am aware of how we are getting out of the COVID surge. At the moment, I cannot provide an immediate response to those patients and I am truly sorry for that. Now, what we are doing as a collective is we are looking at how we can provide services for the utmost, most urgent cancer patients across Northern Ireland and using available resources and facilities as a collective to try to find appropriate places for those people to have their surgery. But the key for me is I need to downturn the COVID heat so that I can upturn services again. And that is totally dependent on the amount of COVID that is in our community and is finding its way into our hospital. So I wish I could provide an assurance to my patients as to when they will get their surgery, but I need the COVID level to drop to enable me to re-engage my theatres with anaesthetics and nursing staff to allow me to do that. Now, I'm certainly going to ask Jennifer to come in because Jennifer's position is very similar to ourselves, as is Cathy's. Thank you, Shane. Um, Paula, I think Shane has covered that uh, very well. It's, this is not a situation that any of us wanted to be in. Um, we also have to be mindful of, that, of the fact that waiting lists have been incredibly challenging in Northern Ireland anyway. It's something that we were already worried about. It was part of the work of TIG previously and of the Rebuilding Management Board. Uh, but as Shane says, until we actually drive down the number of the new positive cases and the level of community transmission, it is really hard to be clear about when we can switch all of this back on. And that's what I meant also about us needing the flexibility and the agility in our surge plans. We, we waited as long as we possibly could, just staying ahead of the requirement. So we only shut down that surgery at the last possible moment, just enough to give us time to train the staff and get them moved to, to the areas that they needed to be in. We want to do the same thing coming out of this, where we start to switch on. Uh, we, we are looking at this across the region. Whenever we look at the postcodes, it may be that one area starts to emerge from this ahead of the others. But we have a commitment to work together as a region that those patients who are most in need will be prioritised for surgery, first of all. So you may not get surgery in your own trust area, but if you are in need, you will be one of the ones who gets the, the precious surgical slot. I do also want to mention, I think this is really difficult for our clinical teams. Um, they are having to work hard to identify who is a priority when we know that all of these patients are actually a priority. So I think that that's really difficult for our clinical teams as well uh, to work through all of those patient lists and to agree, well, actually, this is the priority order. These are the very sickest patients for whom, for whom we are most worried. So it's not a situation that any of us wanted to be in. I, I'm sure we all know individuals uh, who have been impacted by this. Um, our thoughts also go out to, uh, to Minister Poots. Um, he's a former health minister as well, lots of family working in the service, so he knows this uh, as, as well as anyone. It, it's a dreadful situation. So our plea to the public is to continue doing what they're doing so that we can drive down the levels of community transmission to enable us to switch some of these ser services back on as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. And Chair, can I just make one comment? Me? Sorry, I, I'm happy to move on from this, but I just want to come back to what Cathy said around the inpatients um, not getting the vaccine. I've been contacted by nurses in the long stay rehabilitation ward in Hollywell and also the acute mental health ward. Some of them would be in for over three months. So they maybe don't have a physical 
illness, but they are in as inpatients. And I just want to let you know that some nurses have contacted you're concerned about their welfare in terms of vaccination, but I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paula. For Paula, yeah, just go ahead, Kathy. We did do an audit about our long stay patients. So, in our long stay dementia unit, we have vaccinated them and we have vaccinated um, our inpatients in Muckamore because of a majority stay over three months. But we did do an audit to determine that, Paula. So, just so you know, but what we do is we take a limited number of vials out. The question is, you cannot go from ward to ward. So, I hope that's reassuring. Okay, thank you. Can I put on record, actually, my sincere apologies that we cannot treat everyone the way we'd want to treat them at the moment. Um, this, none of this is easy. None of us wanted to be here. Jennifer is right. There is moral distress amongst our staff, but that is nothing in comparison to the anguish and devastation those families are facing, particularly those that had a date for surgery, which was then ripped out as we had to prepare for COVID. So we are doing all we can. We are tracking them individually. The clinical teams are contacting them and you have all of our assurance that as soon as we have the staff and it is safe to do so, we will turn that surgery on. But I need to be honest with you. We are offering some of those patients neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That is chemotherapy before surgery to try and buy time or hold the cancer. That is not optimal. We would not normally do that. And whilst the majority will be safe to do that, there will be a small but significant portion of people when they come to surgery, it will be too late and the disease will have spread. And that for us is something that we never, ever, ever anticipated that we would be in our lifetime. And I cannot apologize enough, but you know what? This virus doesn't spread by itself. It spreads by people who carry the virus and everybody in Northern Ireland needs to play their part so we can get back on track and treat the patients that we desperately want to treat and their families desperately want us to do this. I cannot say this enough, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. Um, so I'm moving on then. I'm going to go to Jerry, then I'll be going to Jonathan, then Pat, then Alan. And I've just asked all members now, I'm conscious of time, and we have lost some time, but time is moving on. If members can keep questions as succinct as possible, and our panel as well, keep answers uh, as succinct as you can, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Orlea. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, there was a bit of confusion there. I thought you were bringing Jerry in. Um, so, Kathy, look, just on your last remarks, sir, I mean, we can hear the sincerity in your voice and the importance of your comments. And I just want to say to the three chief executives, um, just thank you so much. I think you're doing a fantastic job in what is the most difficult of circumstances. And we can certainly hear that um, in your tone here this morning. Um, three quick questions. Um, my first one is around the, the psychological impact that we know um, the staff, the health and social care staff are under at the moment. I know that the psychological helplines um, were put in place at the beginning of the, the first wave. And I'm just wondering if you feel that that is meeting the needs, the psychological needs of your staff at this time, and if there's any other provisions that you can bring into place to try and help support the staff um, in these different times. My second question is one that Pam had touched on, but I don't think that it was it was answered. Um, just to see if any of the trusts are starting to identify trends um, around uh, more younger people being admitted um, with serious illness in relation to, to COVID-19, if we're starting to see any of those patterns in this latest wave. And my third and final question, it's great to hear the reassurances around um, your, your confidence and the capacity of the ICU and the hospitals to deal with um, the upsurge that you may be faced with. But I'm just wondering on top of that, and I'm thinking about Shane saying that at the moment, um, their ICU capacity, that there's there's only two beds left, and it's great that you can move around um, the different hospitals across the north. But has there been any contingency planning that if you do reach your peak, if there's other emergencies and accidents on top of COVID coming in, has there any been any contingency plans um, with 
transferring patients um, across the island on an, an island-wide basis and with the, the structures in the south. Thanks very much. Thank you, Arlea. So we'll go across to the panel then to pick up on those. Yeah, I'm happy to pick up, first of all, in relation to the, the psychological supports. Um, one of the other things that we've been able to do uh, in the Northern Trust, and I think our colleagues are similar, uh, it's not just the psychological helpline, but actual actual support at world, at ward level. Um, quite a bit of intensive support from our psychologists. Uh, we have a psychologist aligned to every key ward in our hospitals, so our emergency department, our assessment units, our respiratory wards, our intensive care units, and that's something that has, has worked very well. Um, where our staff are able to contact that link worker directly. Um, it can be a phone call, it can, it can be a face-to-face -face meeting, often that's what's, what's needed. Um, we're providing those supports, those direct supports to managers and team leaders as well, so that they can help to support their teams. Um, and there's actually been a little bit of regional research done on that from the Impact Research Centre. Uh, now it took place back in November, which is obviously before this current surge, uh, but it did show the benefit that was gained um, in terms of trying to reduce anxiety and so on by having the psychological helplines, but also that direct intervention as well. Uh, we're about to run that study again uh, in February. Uh, we're anticipating that staff will really have needed that uh, this time around. I'm expecting that we are going to need that ongoing psychological support for staff for quite some time. We're very mindful that a lot of them are they're running on adrenaline at the moment and they're just keeping going. Um, we always expect to see a little bit of a dip as we get out of the surge uh, and, and people are exhausted. So uh, I think in terms of people's emotional health and well-being for our staff and also for the wider public as well, that's going to be with us for some years to come. We need to be continuing to, to manage that as we go forward. Just briefly, um, Arlea, in terms of the questions around the younger people, and certainly that is something that we are seeing. Um, it is a combination of both older people being really careful and listening to the public messages and shielding and families certainly protecting them over the Christmas period. That and the vaccination of the over 80s, we are certainly not seeing as many of them in our hospitals, uh, but we are seeing a lot of 50 to 60 year olds um, and, and even younger. And, and that is certainly also very distressing uh, for staff. So again, that's, that, that's the message. This is, this is impacting not just older people, and it is not just people with an underlying condition as well. We are seeing many people in their 50s, 60s, but also younger who, who are really struggling with this, many of them on enhanced respiratory support, many of them being admitted to intensive care as well. Thank you. I mean, if, if I could then follow up on that, I mean, I think Jennifer's point, we are starting to see some early evidence of actually sort of 40s and 50 year olds, which is which is very scary. But also, it's about the 50 year old male obese uh, comorbid. Um, so it isn't about the 80 year olds plus as much it is about younger, as I say, primarily males, we're beginning there's very early evidence here. And I'm sure that there'll be massive studies on it. But we are seeing that shift. Um, and we are seeing patients deteriorate remarkably quickly in that age profile as well. So yes, it is a war. It is worrying. It isn't just simply about 80 year olds plus. Far from it. It, it is a it is a younger a younger issue, but comorbid in terms of diabetes, obesity, etc., having a huge impact. With regards to, uh, I'd support fully the psychological impact bit with lots and lots going on there. And the final bit you you asked about was ICU capacity. We have a strong local critical care network, which we've worked all together to understand what will happen at certain trigger points in terms of the movement of patients around uh, Northern Ireland and into then an enhanced Nightingale. I, I, am, I understand there may be some uh, cross-border um, support. Um, we haven't built that into the into the canny plan canny being the critical care network plan um, but i am aware however there there isn't anywhere on the island of ireland that has uh, lots and lots and lots of capacity sitting doing nothing but we are absolutely have a canny and northern ireland network and if there are a position for mutual aid requirement we have a vehicle that we can explore thank you very much okay thank thank you uh, going then to jerry Jerry Carroll, go ahead, please. Thanks, Chair. Second, can you hear me okay? Yes, hearing you, Jerry. 
Thanks, George. Thanks, everybody, for the presentation. Um, maybe, Kathy, first question, probably uh, for yourself. Um, I have a constituent whose father uh, is an independent living uh, setting. He's Alzheimer's. Uh, his family were affected uh, with COVID. They obviously couldn't um, come and, and care and, and, and assist them. Um, and long story short, eventually it came through that the father uh, had also um, got COVID, but he was um, wandering around with the Alzheimer's, unfortunately, and, and possibly inadvertently uh, infecting people. So I, I raised that because uh, I'm concerned that it could possibly happen uh, again. And I'd just like to know for people in that situation, um, they can obviously get assistance from CURS, but it's quite limited. Uh, is there any uh, suggestion or ideas uh, or proposals about what people in that situation uh, could do to give them the care they need, but also to protect them from inadvertently uh, infecting others from, from COVID? Jerry, this is quite a, a complex, and I'm aware of this case because it rose over the weekend, and I understand that our out of hours team contacted the family, albeit um, maybe later than they would have, have liked because we had to pick them up. Um, just to say we have increased our community beds because sometimes you need an urgent placement if there is difficulty about containing the spread, because I think what you're raising is that an individual could leave their house, wander about, and infect others. Uh, I would rather not use chemical restraint, etc. I would rather place in a place of safety for him and for others. Uh, but of course, we have increased those. We have got special teams that go in to care for people that have COVID. And we are working very actively to try and maintain them safely in their own home. But if an individual can leave their house, you know, you either have to do a mental capacity order to actually make sure it's locked or you put them into a place of safety. So these are very challenging. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm happy to take this out and give you the very detail with the people that are managing that, Jerry. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kathy. I appreciate that, Kathy. And I suppose, I mean, the specifics are obviously important, but my concern would be if this happened uh, again and there's a uh, capacity or facility that people can go to to protect themselves, the community, but also, you know, the workers in the independent living setting. So I think we need to have a, a longer term think about that. Um, we're obviously Just to reassure you, we have um, negotiated a number of what we call rainbow beds, which are either step down COVID or uh, care homes that can actually annex a part and take patients or people with COVID to actually provide that safe care for that, that, that period of time when they're infectious. So okay, I, I, I appreciate if we can get some information uh, sent through on that, Cathy. Uh, I'll push your time, so I'm just going to uh, quickly move on if I can. Um, in terms of the, the urgent uh, surgeries and procedures cancelled uh, in the Belfast uh, area, Cathy, do you know how many people are affected and impacted by that? And, and I suppose finally, um, I think there's been a, a, a lack and no real focus on the role that the NHS and the state can play in really commanding and taking control of the private healthcare capacity uh, that exists in terms of beds, staff and facilities. Uh, do we know the capacity of private for-profit healthcare in Belfast at least? How big is it? How many beds are we talking? And what uh, is your assessment on the role that they could play in terms of being under the direction and control of the NHS to help with this pandemic? Thank you. So probably I, I will take that just to say on the 7th of January, we cancelled 17 inpatients and 33 day case procedures. Jerry, nine of those day cases have already got dates and are rebooked. Um, but last week, just to tell you, because surgery hasn't ceased, we have done urgent and emergency surgery and continue to do that on our Royal site. We did 233 operations. We did 309 either red flag endoscopies for cancer or cystoscopies and we did 91 urgent interventional uh, radiology and we will continue to do that um, and we will also open up as soon as possible however there are a number of patients that are waiting red flag elective cancer which is urgent uh, that we cannot do at the moment because our staff are currently supporting the nightingale as soon as we can we will release those back so that we can undertake it. And whilst we are working as a region 
to try and make sure we maximise all capacity across the region. There are certain cancers and certain surgeries like cardiac, neurosurgery, hepatobiliary surgery and vascular that can only happen in the regional centre. And I think it would be important that that is realised. Uh, the last thing you asked is about the independent sector. We have a small number of lists that we continue to use for our low risk cancers like breast that we continue to avail of. And we are actually sharing that out across the region as a priority. Uh, and equally, I know the Department of Health have had ongoing discussions with the private providers. And in March, there is another 109 lists being freed up to allow us to try and catch up on some of the backlog. However, Jerry, as you will know, in April and May and June, they ceased their private lists to actually hand it over to the NHS. And so we had a lot more capacity in the first surge. We do not have that at the moment. But I know there's ongoing discussions to try and release that. And there's been ongoing discussions around the staff and how they could support the surge. So that has happened, Jerry. I can give you an assurance of that that I know of. Anybody, uh, Shane or Jennifer, do you want to come in? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going across then to Jonathan uh, in the chamber. Jonathan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I will have two questions, but firstly, can I thank the representatives for their briefing. It's important insight into the, the, the work that you're doing and your staff, so we thank you for that. One of, I suppose one of the most alarming things for me in looking at the presentations has been the absentee levels. And I, I say that because at a time whenever we need all hands on deck, Unfortunately, and due to circumstances, we're, we're facing high levels of shortages. And I suppose the Southern Trust, given that it's, it's near to me, I say, Shane, on the 18th of January, 759 staff are out of the system. Could you maybe put that in context from percentage terms over as how much that would be of the total workforce? And does anybody on the panel uh, have any suggestions in how we can tackle that? Uh, or have you brought forward any suggestions uh, to enable uh, as many of the workforce to be there uh, when you need them most? Thank you. Across to panel, please, for that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of our overall workforce, Jonathan, we have about 13,000 members of staff. So when we look today for COVID-related absence, 769. Now, to put it into context, um, out of that 769, just about 400 of those are symptomatic and COVID positive, but uh, the rest of them are absent because they are in fact a confirmed contact or they themselves are shielding um, or they are self-isolating for, for, for other reasons as well. So it's not just about those who are COVID positive, it's also the range of being contacts, et cetera. And that's a reflection of the society we're in at the moment. We, we, our staff are not in a, in a bubble. They're a member of society. And as with every member of society, there is the potential for them to be both COVID positive and to be contacts. So percentage wise for us, it's about 750 out of 13,000. So we're not in the same level as some other trusts. In terms of getting people back to work, we're working with them in terms of our occupational health teams. We're working with them in terms of making sure that they are obviously tested uh, and when they can return to work, they do return to work. And many of our teams, if possible, when they're isolating and are unwell, are also still working from home. It is, it's phenomenal the amount of people who are doing, and, and care professionals as well. We've had clinicians who are um, isolating, but still working from home triaging patients. So the numbers don't necessarily totally reflect the fact that not everyone who's absent is non-productive, quite the opposite. Many of our people who are not at work are still working for us. So it's, it, I think, unfortunately, it's expected that in a pandemic, our staff will get sick. In a pandemic, our staff will have to isolate, but we're working with them, very much working with them to help them back to work and also to understand what work they can do for us when they are isolating. Okay. Thank you for that, and I suppose probably that's echoed across the, the other trust areas, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I suppose probably what I would like to, to move on to is cancellation of cancer services. This is something that uh, has been very emotive, and rightly so, uh, with people right across the country. Uh, there's, a, there's a great sense of fear that cancer will become a, a casualty of COVID, and I understand the services are stretched, and we must uh, endeavour 
to ensure that those patients are seen to uh, as quickly as possible. But I had an email, and I would be interested in your thoughts on this, because while I uh, recognise the contribution of all of our healthcare professionals across the country, and I, I, I fully actually welcome the joint up nature in relation to how the trusts are operating, but my primary concern is patients and indeed my constituents. And I had this email which had said I had two close friends who have passed away because of cancer in the last three months. Both of these cases were identical, each had pain, called the GP who said it wasn't a big problem and prescribed painkillers. As the months went on, they contacted the GP several times. Each time, the GP only talked to them over the phone via phone consultation, never a face-to-face -face appointment for an examination. Eventually, after nine months, the pain of each of them was so bad that they presented at an a and &E where they were admitted. The next day, they had a scan and the cancer was found. Each of them died four days later. These two people died in the last three months. The last one is having her funeral today. She was 56. Now, I'm sure that's heart-wrenching for any of you to listen to. It is indeed me, for me as an elected representative. I would like to know your opinion as to the knock-on effect of um, the unfortunate closure of GP practices for face-to-face -face consultations. And what impact is that having on services presented at AME that our cancers not being picked up when they should? I mean, I'll, I can yeah. certainly start and, and then pass on with colleagues. And I agree fully with you, Jonathan. That is a horrifically sad story of those two individuals and one that we would not wish to happen to anyone. So therefore, I'm genuinely sorry for what has happened to those two individuals. Um, I think it is clear that the pandemic, which is a brutal pandemic, has resulted in the numbers of cancers that have been identified being reduced. And, and, I, and I look at some of our pathology work, for example, and I know we are not finding as many cancers as a trust than we would have found pre-pandemic. So I think it is having an impact. I, I cannot quantify that, John. I don't have the information that would allow me to quantify how many we haven't seen because of the pandemic. But I agree, we, we, we are not seeing the same numbers of cancer diagnoses coming through the Southern Trust, and I imagine that's similar for my colleagues on this screen. We need to get our services back up and running, and we need to get COVID reduced to a level that we can. And therefore, I, I can't make any other comment, Jonathan, than that I'm horrified, and I'm saddened, and we will do everything we can to get services up and running. Specifically around GP services, I can't comment on that because I, I don't run GP services. I, I really don't. And I know, however, from speaking with my GP colleagues, they are working every hour God sends as well because the demands that they are being faced with. But in terms of specifically around GPs, you would need to be specifically speaking to GPs because I'm, I'm, I don't run the GP service, John. But I can say as we are having fewer cancer diagnoses coming through the trusts. Now, I'll ask whether Jennifer or Cathy would wish to, to further comment on that. I suppose just very briefly, I completely concur with everything that Shane has said. There does appear to be some early evidence of late presentations to emergency departments, um, which is clearly very, very troubling uh, to us. Um, but certainly we are seeing lower numbers coming through in terms of our diagnostics, and that, that does concern us that people are perhaps not presenting early enough or not getting to see their GP. And by the time they get to us, it's a very late presentation, uh, which inhibits our ability to actually be able to do something to help them. That's a, a very, very distressing story uh, to hear about those two individuals. That's exactly the same within Belfast. There is fewer red flag or urgent referrals coming through to us as outpatients where they do. We will continue to see them face-to-face -face, uh, and prioritise their endoscopy and cystoscopy, etc. However, we are also aware through our ED colleagues that there are reported uh, increasing incidents of late presentation. And because of our long waiting list historically, that was already a factor um, that you will be aware of uh, across Northern Ireland. But this is a problem that we think will be getting worse because of COVID. The, the factors are multifactorial. Some people are presenting late because they're fearing 
going forward. Our screening programs have been under pressure because of social distancing. And then, of course, as the GPs have been called off either to do the COVID assessment centres or the vaccination, have been on other things as well as their primary care service. Yeah, so no. I think it's probably multifactorial. No, and I appreciate every one of your yeah. comments in, rela in relation to that. And I understand fully that you don't run GP service. My question was primarily uh, the the in, the pro the with GP face to face consultations not happening, you are facing the knock on impact on how that's affecting services. Uh, you have clearly outlined that, and I suppose the late admissions. I, I would encourage you. I would say this does happen. I understand GPs are working around the clock, and all healthcare professionals are. But I would like to think that that's fed back into the system to, to for an understanding as to face to face consultations with GPs is essential, uh, and I think that that point has to be echoed uh, as we go forward. And even in relation to vaccinations, right. there's a wide range of community pharmacists that can play their part to open and allow face-to-face -face consultations for GPs. So thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, moving then on to Pat Sheehan. Pat, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thanks to the panel. Um, I listened to Fergus Walsh from BBC News last night saying that uh, the UK had the highest death rate in Europe and the worst in the world. Uh, in the meantime, other countries have performed much, much better uh, in terms of low numbers of deaths or health services not being under pressure. And I suppose the outcomes. Uh, depend in the main on the strategic planning of health departments and governments in those countries. And I realise that here, even though we have a devolved uh, situation, the department develops the strategy to combat the virus, uh, and the trusts just deal with the consequences or the failures, uh, some of which have been mentioned, services being cancelled, cases like the two Jonathan mentioned previously. So given all of that, and, and given the fact that other countries have performed much better and the trusts have to pick up the pieces, have, have the trusts had any input into development of plans to combat the virus, uh, any sort of strategic vision uh, are they being asked to input into? Thanks. Okay, over to the panel there, please. Thank you. I mean, I, I can certainly start if you would like. I mean, all trusts are part of the Regional Management Board, and the Regional Management Board is a structure that allows all stakeholders to be involved in the development of the plans for health and social care. Now, what I would stress is it's a pandemic, and therefore it is a command and control structure that we use, which is our gold, silver, and bronze command and control. And therefore, clearly, there is a goal, and that goal is the Department of Health. But what I would say is we have been involved in many, many conversations as a regional management board in trying to deal with uh, the situation. The other thing I am aware of, and, and I, I need to verify this, but I was discussing with my medical director yesterday, is that Northern Ireland is in a slightly different place in terms of mortality than the rest of the UK. You know, as I say, I need to do further reading on that. It was made very clear to me by my medical director yesterday. It would seem to indicate our death rate is in fact lower than the other parts of the United Kingdom. But but I would I would stress, and I, I maybe ask Kathy if she's aware of anything further there. But my understanding is that we are different in terms of the rest of the UK. Well, I suppose, but, uh, Jean, sorry, Shane, just to interrupt you, I apologise. I'm not really concerned about comparing here with. Uh, uh, with Britain or across the water. I, I, I'm trying to make comparisons between here and New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, and so on, and, and, and why we are doing so much badly, so, so much worse than those countries. And I appreciate that's what you were asking, and I think what's clear to say that we have worked as a collective to try to find the best plan forward for for Northern Ireland. I mean, I'll ask whether Cathy or Jennifer um, would wish to comment on that. So just to, to put that in context, Pat, when you compare us against New Zealand, you will know that we have had much higher infectivity rate and a much higher mortality rate because you can't have one without the other. Um, so you're right. Um, but New Zealand took um, very different action 
to that that was taken at a, a policy level in the Department of Health. They, they closed down early. They are quite a, a discreet island uh, that really is fed through Australia. And Australia also has done very well out of the pandemic. Uh, I do think that across the UK, Northern Ireland has done well as a jurisdiction. Uh, we have had one, certainly in the first and second surges, our mortality has been lower and our hospitals have not been under the pressure that you will have seen in the NHS. Uh, we are in the middle of the third, so I'd reserve the right to see what happens in this one. And certainly towards the end of this year, we had some um, community areas that had very high infectivity rates. And usually what you see in hospitals reflects what's happening in the community as, as displayed with what Southern Trust was facing only a few uh, days and weeks ago. Um, so I watch the space before I make an overall judgment on that, but certainly in the first wave, we closed earlier. People of Northern Ireland behaved very differently and um, they were very conscious. And I think that was because, um, you know, uh, we as a all island uh, took a different uh, approach. And I think that protected us to somewhat, um, but we have not had the same early lockdown and really contact tracing, isolation, screening that you would see in the likes of Korea or you'd see in the likes of New Zealand. It's been a different policy. Okay, thanks Thanks for that. And, and, and I appreciate that, that it's not the trusts who develop policy. And just one final short question. Uh, has the department or the PHA or the HS, uh, the, the Health and Social Care Board, have any of them transmitted uh, or communicated to you a plan, a contingency plan in the event of a, a vaccine escape strain developing? Thanks. Um, can you can you just repeat that? So is it is this Pat in in the in the situation where the the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca vaccine is no longer uh, you know for, uh, gives protection against yeah. COVID nineteen or the variants? Have we got a contingency plan that we are aware of? Yes. Well, give, given the speculation that. Uh, with the high levels of transmission and the mutation of the virus and different strains emerging, there is a serious concern that at some stage a variant is going to emerge that is resistant to the, the current vaccines that are being used or developed. And I'm wondering, uh, does the department have any plans in hand in the event of that happening? Okay, so this would be largely the large protein spike. At the moment, the variants um, do still seem to be, uh, the vaccine would still seem to be protective of that. Uh, but I think that would be a question that you'd be best asking the department because as a chief exec, I'm not aware of that, but that's not to say they don't have that. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you and go on then. Thank you, Pat. Okay, going then to uh, Alan in the Senate Chamber. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to place on record my appreciation for the work uh, of the, uh, the panel and their teams. Uh, undoubtedly, they've saved uh, countless lives during this pandemic. Um, it's, it's disappointing to hear and to read um, some of the uh, unrealistic narrative around expectations of what the NHS is currently capable of delivering. And if a decision was taken today to instruct uh, all these trusts uh, to run a full range uh, in the normal outpatient clinics and to carry out all elective surgery over and above the emergency and the time-critical work that they are currently carrying out, what would the effect be on uh, each of these trusts and particularly, what would be the impact on the patients currently being treated in your hospital beds and the staff treating them? And would it be difficult for the trust to guarantee the full safety of those who would be queuing up to receive that elective surgery and indeed uh, the safety of patients currently in the hospitals? Thank you.
Jenna. Yeah. I'm happy to start, Chair. Um, I, uh, thank, thank you, you. for your for your question. I think, as as we described earlier, we are under such pressure that we're only able to cope with the COVID demands by having to take that really difficult decision about downturning a range of our elective services uh, to be able to cope with the demands are there. It is simply not possible for us to stand up all of those services at the moment and to deliver them at the same time as we are trying to manage the COVID response. It, it's just not possible to do that. I think any further dilution of the likes of the ICUs, et cetera, uh, and you know there is very good evidence about uh, nursing bed ratio and safety of patient care. So any significant dilution would put patients at risk. And furthermore, if we were to open up all of our patients because of the footfall through our hospital, so for the likes of Belfast, it's 16,000 people are seen a week in our outpatients, we would only add to the community transmission, which is why we are continuing virtual and only seeing those which are red flag and cancer and need to be examined or those with mental health issues where we know if they're not seen face to face, there is actually a significant deterioration. So we, we have to play our part uh, to actually minimize community transmission. But equally, I have to provide safe services for those in my care, and I will do that. And quite simply, we do not have enough to do everything. You, you know, there is something like over 800 patients with COVID-19 in our hospitals at the moment. That is 800 people more than we did have last year. That has to come from somewhere. There are 67 people with COVID in our ICU. That number didn't exist last year. So we need to make sure we have the staff to care for them. That is the reality that we are facing. And something has to give, and that is a really difficult decision for us. But we have to face the urgent care and the COVID care that presents at our emergency departments and manage that safely at the moment. Okay. And as soon as it is safe, we will turn on the cancer and elective work. As soon as it is safe, we will do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. Um, so I've just had an indication then that, uh, Cara, maybe for a quick question there, Cara, please, and this will be our final question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I'd just like to thank uh, Jennifer, Cathy and Sheehan. Uh, for answering all our questions today. I know you're under immense pressure, but uh, my, my uh, question pertains to just around the delay um, of uh, cancer surgeries. I know this is a decision that nobody wants to take uh, and is a, a symptom, a really unfortunate symptom of this horrible virus and how it's really um, you know, impacted our society. But my question just surrounds the, the, the patients who have been affected by these delays. Do they receive any kind of um, you know, counseling ar around this? And if so, how is that facilitated facilitated? Is it through Macmillan or what support is available there for them? Thank you. Yeah, over to the panel there. Thank you, Cara. Go ahead, panel. So, yes, go ahead, Jennifer. Your, your question. Uh, I'm sure colleagues will come in uh, as well. At the moment, Cara, uh, because it's supposed to relatively early it's been the clinical team so it's mostly been the clinical team directly responsible for that patient who has been making direct contact with them and then it's, it's an individual comment and conversation depending on what their needs actually are okay thank you very much jennifer i would echo okay from jennifer's point of view the clinical teams are in regular contact they are they are tracked as patients they are monitored closely. And of course, if they go forward for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then the oncologists and the teams are, are picking them up. But Karen, none of this is easy. None of this mm -hmm. is easy. Particularly for the families and the patients, and then for the staff on the front line. I understand, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, and and thank you to our panel today. And I have to say, it, it, has, it has certainly come across, you know, how, 
how passionate you are in relation to that and how, how vexed you are in relation to the uh, the impact that this is all having. And I suppose um, one of the things that I think I would like you to send us on uh, following this is a copy of the modeling that is used because I think it is important that we continue to learn throughout this pandemic. And I noted in the conversation around comparisons with other areas and other countries, and there are indeed some stark comparisons, but for me, one of the one of the biggest comparisons that we will eventually have to look into is why we're doing so much worse than the rest of this island, never mind any other islands, where we have similar demographics, we have similar social uh, connectedness, and yet our our rates are much worse than, than than the other part of this island. So I would be very keen to get the 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 modelling that you referred to earlier around the critical care and the bed planning models. If we could see that, please, because we know that planning has been a factor here at times in this. Um, but I would like to thank you, each and every one of the panel members, for giving us your time today, for answering and addressing all those questions, and to reiterate uh, my, my colleagues on the committee, um, thanks to you for, for the very difficult but important uh, role that you that you are playing and have played through a serious amount of months now in common with the frontline staff. You have been dealing with this now for 11 months, and it, it, certainly, it certainly has, I'm sure, taken a toll on on uh, on everyone that's trying to deliver that service. So um, thank you for that panel, and uh, we are now going to take a very very short break just to get uh, our next presentation on the line. So could I ask members to return online for eleven fifteen to resume with our uh, with uh, our presentation on vaccinations at eleven fifteen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Northern Chair. Ireland thank, you. thank you, Chair. Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, um, members, welcome back. We're we're back now for the second presentation this morning in terms in relation to our work on COVID nineteen. Um, we're joined this morning by Patricia Donnelly, who will be giving us a presentation in relation to the rollout of the vaccine program. Um, so Patricia joining us by video link. So um, Patricia, I'm hoping that you can hear us there okay. And I would like to ask you, very, well, firstly, yes, I can see you there now, Patricia. Very much welcome, uh, welcome you to our meeting this morning, Patricia. And I know that there is a great deal of interest in the, the rollout of the vaccine program, which is, which is a key element of the response to COVID-19. Um, so could you go ahead, Patricia, with your presentation to our committee, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, what I've got in front of you, I'd, I'm going to be very brief with this because I previously described to you all the plans we have for the programme and what you will see in front of you today is a summary of that plan. So there's a lot of information I've packed into a short space. You'll see across the top of your screen the five phases of the programme and, uh, and then the middle piece is where we're at with the phasing. So phase one was the priority one and priority two groups. And members will remember that we were working with the JCVI, the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation priority groups, and uh, we've got clear advice from them about which groups to take in which order, and they've done that on the basis of who is most at risk. So we are just about to complete phase one. I'm delighted to tell you all that we have, um, we're absolutely um, bang on target uh, for the plan that we have completed virtually all care homes, uh, there were a small number, and I think it's now down to two or three who are an outbreak. We expect to get to them within days. Uh, and uh, we have completed, virtually completed our um, staff group. We have, our, have widened it out to the wider social care community, and uh, that should be completed by the end of January. And uh, as you may know, our over 80s commenced uh, on the 11th of January, and we expect that also to complete um, by in the next week. Uh, so we're ready and geared up for phase two, which is moving to priority groups three to six. And you will see that February is going to be a very busy month as this is a very large uh, group, but we're relying on all our teams. You'll see on the right hand side of the screen, all the delivery models I told you about before. They've become very experienced. Um, we've had vaccination centres, that uh, some of which run seven days a week, some of which do not need to run seven days a week, particularly in the West. They have three centres, so they're distributing the work among all of those areas. 
Um, we've had mobile teams who've gone out uh, to care homes. Uh, it has been a total team effort, including important, crucial role for pharmacy. Uh, and uh, we are now have uh, the GP and general practice have commenced, uh, and that is expected to ramp up through uh, the month of February and March. We are starting with roving teams uh, to deal with people who are housebound. Uh, we, uh, we have, nobody has forgotten about them. Uh, we're starting with the over 80s. Uh, we were awaiting advice from the MHRA, who are the licensing body, around the particular controls and the infection prevention controls that we need when we're taking a punctured vial from one house to another. Some of these seem very simple and straightforward, but actually, uh, we would be failing you and our community if we didn't deliver a vaccine program that was not just effective, but was also safe. Uh, we hope to bring on a community pharmacy when we have vaccine enough uh, to do that. Um, you will see in the bottom left hand uh, part of your screen. I came to you before, uh, just before um, the um, Pfizer vaccine was vaccinated and we've had good, healthy, steady supplies of that. Uh, I've told you about how challenging it was. Um, and of course, the teams have really stepped up to the challenge, have, have become very expert at that. And I think uh, the record in Northern Ireland has stood very good comparisons to elsewhere uh, in, in the country and elsewhere in the world uh, in our use of the Pfizer vaccine. But we've been able to do that by having that team of pharmacists as well as vaccinators. And we've worked very closely with MHRA to do it. We've had more recently um, uh, the approval for the AstraZeneca vaccine. And again, this is a more conventional vaccine where uh, we're very happy to receive it. Um, it's been used in the primary care program. It has a longer shelf life. It's a more conventional. However, it's still a multi-dose vaccine. Patricia. Yes. Patricia, just, just sorry, sorry to interrupt you. We're getting a bit of feedback there and a bit of like keyboard noise. I'm not sure if it's from yourself or maybe from one of our other members who have, have neglected to mute. I could just ask members to check that they're all on mute. And Patricia, if you had access to a headset, it's much, much clearer. There, I think there's a wee bit of feedback coming from your end of things. Oh, I apologize. I'm not in my own office because I couldn't get the, the system to work. Um, I. Uh, apologies, I don't have access to headset, but I will try for any future uh, presentations to do that. I'm not touching the keyboard, so I hope the noise is not for me. I will make even just a bit of moving noise, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll persevere. Uh, just be conscious of that, and hopefully we'll, we'll get there okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, if it's, if it's any easier, if we take down that screen, um, because I've, I've described what's on the screen, it's a summary of what I'm actually going to say. Uh, so if colleagues could remove that, it would be helpful. I have provided one more uh, slide, which is from a PowerPoint presentation, and it is just to tell you, yes, um, this is how we're doing. Um, we're always a day late, and Chair, I had hoped by this morning I would have had yesterday's figures. We get them uh, early morning in the day following the, all the activity. It, we usually have a summary report provided by 12 o'clock, so you'll understand that this is from the day before. And you will see from this that overall we've vaccinated 160,000 doses and 138,000 people. So the second doses have largely been in the care homes, um, but it's also been vaccinated. Um, a few others that for uh, particular reasons needed to be vaccinated at that time. Uh, you'll see that we've just over, and I expect that to be much higher than that by today, of the over 80 year olds, and that we have very, very little vaccine wastage. So maybe take down the screen and, and uh, I can answer any questions because I'm sure there's a limited amount of information you need uh, for me to just tell you about, but you might have more questions that would be helpful for me to answer to you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, so, first one from me in relation to we have just taken evidence from the chief executives of three of our trusts, and they have reflected a picture to us of increasing hospitalisation of younger people. So, can you can you advise us? Is there um, ongoing assessment of the needs of the groups that are being vaccinated uh, via the JCVI or whatever to take account of that? Uh, developing information. 
is there is there an ongoing review in on relation to who gets vaccinated at what point? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, someone has appeared with a headset. I just try and rig this. Um, Go ahead. Uh, uh, there is ongoing review. I've, had, I've continued to answer while I while I do this. There is ongoing review, and it's by the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation. Um, they're meeting today. They meet uh, on a very regular basis um, to provide that um, assessment. So they continually look at a number of factors. For example, the um, effectiveness of the vaccine itself. Um, the groups that need to be prioritised, etc., and who um, and what the emerging evidence is for the use of the vaccine. So they keep that under review. Uh, I understand that. I mean, they meet several times a week, so it's a continuous process. I mean, right now they're still focusing on those early groups that are um, most likely to be uh, the, the greatest affected, most likely to have the most severe symptoms, most likely to die. So I think it's probably in the next phases of the program, they might give further advice about who should be coming forward. And whatever they say, uh, Chair, we will act in that way and take that forward. Okay, thank you, Patricia. I am, I am hearing some concern from GPs in relation to the rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine, where, for example, a GP, just, just to take easily used figures, a GP has uh, 75 over 80s on their books. They're allocated 100 doses. Another GP may have 125. Now, the GP who has 25 left over when he has his cohort of 80s over 80s done, they're telling me they can't use that nor can they pass it on to the GP who has a further 25 who needs done. Are you aware of that issue? And is there a way to streamline that to ensure we're getting maximum efficacy day to day? Uh, we are aware of this issue. They come in either packs of 80 or packs of 100. So you can imagine that if uh, what we've tried to do is allocated in the most sensible way possible. So it may be possible that uh, uh, someone who had 125, the example that you've given, um, we should now have allocated enough for him to cover that um, that group. And what we're advising from this week is for those GPs who have vaccine left, they should start to vaccinate their over 75s. So every GP should now have enough to vaccinate their over 80s. Um, we can't have GP share that is part of the licensing of, of MHRA. They do not allow uh, GPs to become distributors of any drugs. Um, so it, it's a control issue. So we're acting within that legal framework. Okay, thank you. And the final quick one for me then, Patricia, is I have been approached by, by numerous people, but, but uh, just to give one example of a person who has applied to become a vaccinator, he, this, this, this gentleman is a previous nurse of long years experience, had engaged with the system, hadn't gotten acknowledgement for a period of time. When he did get an acknowledgement, there was a series of bureaucratic hurdles that were, that were placed in his way to the extent that he finally dropped out of the system. And I'm hearing a lot of people have tried to become vaccinators. Now, I'm aware this is also a problem that appears to be raising its head in relation to return to practice more generally with nurses. But in order to keep our nurses on the front line, it obviously would make sense if we could get more vaccinators in and not draw from that same pool. Are you aware of that issue? And is there anything being done to combat that? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. We are aware of the issue, and we've got a team um, working through the PHJ. We're working very actively on this. There are a number of steps. I fully understand that um, an individual returning to practice will feel they've had years of experience, but there are requirements around the safe administration of vaccine and the understanding that for some people there may be an allergic reaction. Therefore, they need to understand and identify that they need to be able to deal with an anaphylactic reaction. So therefore, their resuscitation training needs to be up, uh, up to date, uh, even at a basic level. So there are some things that even for experienced individuals, they need to be able to do. Uh, and the team at PHA um, have worked through, they've had a lot of people who've stepped forward and they've managed uh, to both uh, screen them and interview them. And quite a few of those are now coming forward and into the vaccination program and importantly, to start to support the GP programme as it rolls out. So I'm very disappointed that the experience of an individual, I know it's frustrating, but we do ask people to be patient about it. We will get through these and and uh, and for people not to give up. Um, they, I, I understand from a briefing yesterday that the very elaborate training that was required of individuals to return uh, to this kind of practice has now been reduced to one day. 
So I think that should be reassuring. So for people who have got uh, have done that, I will appeal to them to uh, try again, and they may find it's a bit more straightforward for them. Yeah. Just, just to be clear, Patricia, I used the individual as an example. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing that from right across the north and from right across a number of, of individuals who have tried to go the same route. So it clearly is a, a more systemic problem. Yeah. Um, OK, I'm going to move on because I'm very, very conscious of time. So if we could ask members maybe um, a key question. First of all, we do one round of, of key questions. If members can try and a uh, a pick up on the fact that if other people have answered their their question or their query related related to their specific, maybe they can go with something additional, um, or something different. So I'll just go I'll just go then quickly across to Jerry Carroll. Or sorry, I'll, I'll go to I'll go to Deputy Chair Palm first, then Jerry, and then Kara. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so Pam thank, you very, thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me. Um, Thank you, Patricia, again for your attendance here today. Very important to have you with us, and well done on uh, the progress so far. So far, I think um, it's it's wonderful to see the, the rollout happening. Um, my, um, I have a list of questions, and I know I can't ask them all, so I'll go with um, initially GP communication. And there is a, some concern that GPs are uh, doing their absolute best to to be organised and have the right people in place um, at the time for vaccination. But if they don't have enough notice of when they're going to receive uh, their supplies of vaccine, it's difficult for them to actually organise that and have the people ready to get that job on their arm. So uh, I just want to ask if, if there's more being done in terms of making sure the GPs have enough communication in a timely fashion to allow them to organise to have their, their patients in the right place to get that vaccine. And as just on the back of that, can I ask you if is it safe to assume and to put that message out there that if you are eligible for the flu vaccine, that, that you will be communicated with probably in a similar fashion uh, and, and brought forward for the COVID vaccine? Uh, thank you very much. If I take those in order, um, the first one, I, I think we tried to, uh, to work very closely with GPs and we work with GP colleagues in um, the Royal College uh, in the BMA and with the GP advisors at the Health and Social Care Board. So we meet several times a week. We're, I think there's a webinar today for a wider group of GPs and I've spoken at that before. Um, but the vaccine supply itself, we get an indicative um, delivery schedule, but the closer it gets to it, the more it changes. So in fact, we would dearly like to be able to advise people as far in advance, but sometimes it's just in time that we will give them that kind of information. And what happens is when we've got an absolute confirmation of a next uh, delivery coming up, which is what happened this week, we had a delivery uh, yesterday, um, what we what we will do is um, we will then allocate a quota to GPs so they can then order against that. But they won't actually get it until it arrives, and it might be then a day or two later. This is not like the flu program. When the flu program was operating, what people are able to do is they're preloaded vials. They get a good stock of it. They know exactly who they're going to vaccinate. It's all very rational. This is a more um, I think I described it as agile uh, program, and I really mean we're on our tiptoes all the time around it. We're having to be um, react very quickly. We're having to be responsive, and it, it's frustrating for GP colleagues. Fully appreciate that, and we're doing absolutely everything we can to get it to them as quickly as possible. It goes out as quickly as it comes in. We don't hang around. We're not storing lots of vaccine, um, so it is important that we do work closely with them, and we. We help them understand the situation, but we also help them manage their frustrations and uh, and do all that we possibly can to uh, avert those frustrations. So, um, so I think that uh, that that's all we can do at this moment in time and try and, and try and keep that communication open. To your second question, which was about who would be eligible, well, the JCVI largely aligns with that eligibility group. It's largely, but you're calling people slightly out of sequence. The GPs, what they would normally do is look at that whole group, and that's, uh, I think, about 450,000 people, so it's not small. They've achieved it significantly. It's offered to that number of people every year. Uh, I'm not saying that it's uptaken by all those people every year, but we are finding the uptake of this vaccine much higher than that. Um, but this time for GPs, it's and this is the challenge for them, and I appreciate it's a difficult one, because if they were running a clinic, they could call in lots of people, do it all very efficiently. 
but this time they're having to call in, they're over 80 year olds, and then they're over 75 year olds, and then they're over 70 year olds, because that's the way the vaccine's coming in. And that's the way the risk is for these individual groups. So we're trying to move them group by group. So uh, we're trying as much as possible. And for people who normally would get the flu vaccine, we would say to them, you will, they will, the program will get round to you, you're on a list. And as I said at the start, um, we are moving on those very large groups of priority three to priority six, which is moving down the age ranges now from 75 um, right, uh, 79 right down to 65 and all the clinically vulnerable uh, and their carers so we will get to these groups and move our way through the more the vaccine uh, supplies are available the quicker we'll do it okay chair can i come back there quickly what's that yes quickly Pam, please yeah thank you thank you yeah. for that patricia um i just wanted to ask in terms, obviously, the vaccine is not available to children, certainly not to under 16s, uh, but there are um, a certain amount of children under 16 year olds who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, do you know if it's being looked at to see whether uh, the vaccine could be made available to the immediate household or carers um, and also maybe to, um, to special educational needs teachers and school staff? who are surrounding those clinically extremely vulnerable children uh, by way of a protective bubble? Yes, I think uh, CARES will, will come into uh, um, priority group six, so we should get to them um, sometime later, um, but not immediately. Um, so anyone in that uh, caring role will get, that, will get the vaccine. Um, uh, I think they're keeping under review whether children get it and anyone who's extremely clinically vulnerable who's under the age of uh, 16, I think there'll be an individual assessment made about whether they should have the vaccine and we'll wait for further advice from JCVI about that. Um, in terms of those who are working with those vulnerable populations, anyone who's involved um, where there might be um, uh, aspirating procedures will already have been offered the vaccine. Um, but the wider group of those who have contact with them, such as teachers and others, we're waiting advice for that and uh, whether they can go ahead and vaccinate. As I said, once JCVI will give us that approval and that uh, uh, advice, we will um, call them forward for, for vaccination. That's excellent. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I think we're still getting some now. We're still hearing a wee pinging match um, going on there. So maybe if you could mute or turn off your email, um, because I think everyone else is on mute, but we're hearing a, a, a beep there frequently. So maybe just mute or turn off your email, please. And I, I'll then go across to uh, Jerry Carroll for our next question. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Patricia, can you hear me okay, Chair? Yeah. Yep. Thanks, thanks, Patricia. Uh, Patricia, my, my question relates to the, the delay in the second dose. Um, I've raised this, uh, of the Pfizer vaccine, I've raised this uh, consistently, and I think at the very least, medical advice is split uh, on it. And I'm concerned that we might just be, you know, forcibly or, or uh, going along with the, the Tory approach to this. And I note in, in Israel, a country that's obviously disgracefully denied vaccines to the Palestinians, but uh, in Israel, they've expressed serious concern about the delay of the second dose uh, and the efficacy of that. Um, how, how confident are you uh, in that process uh, and that the delaying of the, the second dose of the, the Pfizer vaccine um, is safe and is the correct uh, approach? Uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, I've, I'm aware of the media reports about the experience in Israel. And uh, as I understand it, the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunization are considering that evidence and I think have been directly in contact with um, the Israeli authorities to try and understand uh, what that evidence will be. And I suspect that they would then, well, it would be the normal process, uh, they'll then review it and they may or may not issue further advice to us about it. So, I mean, our responsibility in the vaccine program is to act on that advice. I don't think any of us feel that we're the competent authority to say what the best uh, um, uh, approach to this is. Um, but what I would say to you, Jerry, is that the opportunity that the delay in the second dose is given, I did a calculation um, uh, four or five days ago, and I think we had vaccinated an extra 48,000 people that we couldn't have uh, been able to vaccinate. Um, 
if we had been doing second doses at this point. However, whatever the scientific advice that comes forward, we will follow it uh, in the vaccination program. And I suppose uh, I would want people to have confidence that we will do the very best that we can and we'll act under that advice and as quickly as possible under that advice. Thanks. And just a quick follow-up. Thanks, Patricia. I mean, it may well be safe, as you indicated, but I think there's concerns being raised uh, by, by many uh, medical organisations. And I'm just concerned that uh, this uh, is a pattern that we are just following blindly, the approach in London. Uh, and actually, this could, uh, could, obviously could have uh, long-term effects, not on the spread of the virus solely, but uh, to people who uh, are COVID deniers uh, wrongly. But this could... Uh, sorry, vaccination uh, deniers, and this could speed up some of the kind of warped uh, and untrue uh, comments. So I think it's it's very very serious stuff. Uh, just then, I think the education workers and teachers, the fact that um, SEN schools are still open as well. I appreciate you're waiting on uh, direction from JCBI, but I think they need uh, clarity as soon as possible. Um, on where and when they're going to get vaccinated, as, like I said, especially as um, schools, uh, SEN schools are still open and it, uh, there may be further news on, on other schools. So I think that ne it needs to be a priority as soon as possible. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And just to, just to indicate to members as well, um, we will be having the minister joining our meeting on the 11th of February. So that's another opportunity to pick up on issues. And um, Patricia, I'm sure if there are outstanding questions after the session that we can feed those through to you via the committee and that, that we get a response on that. So those are those are other other avenues as well. So I'm going now then have an order now. I'm going to Pat Sheehan, then Jonathan, then Orlea, then Alan, then Paula. So that's the running order at the present time. I'm going then now to Pat Sheehan. Go ahead, Pat. Okay, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Patricia, for coming in this morning. Patricia, um, the, the vaccination programme is obviously very welcome, but serious concerns have been raised that given the high level of transmission of this virus within the community, the greater the chance uh, of a mutation that becomes uh, resistant to the vaccine. And I'm just wondering, first of all, have you have there been any discussions with you around that a possibility and what are the contingency plans? And secondly, do you see this vaccination program as part of an integrated strategy? And if you do, what are the other elements of that strategy for the six months, the year ahead? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Pat. If I take the first question, which was around the uh, efficacy of this uh, vaccine, as far as we're aware, and as I've been advised, I think this vaccine is effective against the variants at the moment. That isn't to say there wouldn't be a variant that would emerge that it would be less effective with. However, that's something that I believe, I'm not directly advised on this, but I believe the companies are aware of that and will develop uh, the appropriate amendments to the vaccine. This is a continuous process. Um, the, the pandemic itself has been a learning process. The vaccine as it's deployed is a learning process. And we're aware that manufacturers do um, change and amend and revise, as indeed happens every year with the flu vaccine. They do have to change it for the strains each year. And so I would be confident that uh, whatever comes, I think the, the the speed at which they've been able to do this would be one that could meet our requirements. Uh, the second, which is about an integrated strategy, well, clearly it is part of a, a, a bigger a bigger picture. What I indicated at the very beginning was this, this is a five phase plan, and uh, the fifth phase is a continuous and uh, an expectation there would be an ongoing vaccination program. Uh, in the same way that the flu vaccine is each year. We're not quite sure what the interval might be for this uh, um, COVID-19 uh, vaccine. It may be a booster at some other interval, but we expect that as this rolls out, as they do the antibody testing, as they follow up individuals, as they look at the impact of who gets ill, how ill they get, they may give us advice on the type of vaccine that should be targeted to an individual group or a particular vulnerable group. Um, and I think that will inform the annualised uh, programme, whatever that will be. So you're quite right, it needs to be part of a continuous process. Yeah, well, it's not so much continuous, and, and I understand that in regard to vaccination. However, what I'm concerned about is if there, if there is a mutation that develops uh, resistance to the vaccine, and the manufacturers have to 
tweak the vaccine or revamp it or do whatever, that may make it may take time. Uh, and to have that whole new vaccine rolled out may take time. So in the meantime, we need to have other measures apart from vaccination. I mean, I would be very concerned if we were just putting all our all our eggs in the vaccination basket. So I'm just wondering, what are the other elements of this integrated strategy? Well, I don't think I'm the person to ask for that. And I'm sure that when you have an opportunity to talk to minister and CMO, they'll be able to advise on that. But what I should say to you, Pat, is that the advice that is given to anyone who gets the, the vaccine is um, that you continue to take, be socially distanced, you wash your hands, you wear a mask or face protection, uh, you know, that you still take those uh, protective measures because it takes a while for immunity to build up. It will not be affected with every single person, although we hope that anyone who is affected is much less affected than they would have been prior uh, to the vaccine. So they have to take all those protective measures. What will make a difference is a reduction in community transmission. That is the big thing that will make a difference. Um, the vaccination will protect okay, you. But those are wider questions. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, sorry, I, I actually should have brought Cara in after Jerry there, so I'll go back to Cara now, and then I'll go to Jonathan or Leah, Alan and Paula. So Cara Hunter, go ahead, Cara, please. Thank you, Chair, uh, and Patricia, thank you again for being here today. Uh, I spoke with you on Tuesday, uh, and you provided uh, great clarity around a lot of the issues uh, I was curious about. Uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to make a comment uh, on Jerry's um comments earlier i absolutely agree i think it's really crucial that we seek uh, more clarity around um you know the reports from israel this morning and i think access to that data will help us you know scrutinize efficiently and support the department of health in tackling this virus and um, but, but, but patricia my question um it, it surrounds i spoke with a mental health charity earlier in the week um and their mental health counselors were curious just around what considerations have been given um, regarding, you know, staff that are providing mental health support who aren't in the grouping for HSC staff. Has there been any consideration given um, to them because they're working uh, and engaging face to face, but um, aren't included in that grouping? Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Uh, well, we have moved beyond HSC staff and we've done that some weeks ago and uh, we moved on to groups that provide services on behalf of the trust on behalf of the PHA or the board. So most of those are in the voluntary and community sector. So it will be things like Praxis, it will be other um, uh, charitable organizations. So some should have been called forward already for that. So maybe the individual isn't aware. We work very closely with NISC, um, who is the registrant body um, for a lot of those social care workers uh, to make sure that they um, are aware that they can um, uh, come forward for vaccination. So. Uh, people should have had notification of that already. Fantastic. I can go back to them with Thank that you. then. Thank you, Patricia. That's me. Okay. Thank you, um, Cara. And then moving back to the Senate chamber there to Jonathan. Go ahead, Jonathan, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patricia. And, and I'm not here to be critical of the programme whatsoever. In fact, I want to congratulate Patricia and the team in the efficient way in which you have started out this programme. It's cleared all the league tables that Northern Ireland is performing very well, and I want to congratulate you and your leadership and, indeed, the rest of your team. But that being said, it would be remiss of me not to, to take the opportunity to push for quicker and a safe and efficient programme as we see um, the debate move from supply to distribution that's widely accepted across the United Kingdom. So could I ask, and I'll, I'll say a couple of questions here, can we have an outline of the likely quantities arriving in Northern Ireland of the vaccine over the next four weeks? Um, how many in total vaccinators do we have at present? Um, I have raised just before you came on the program or onto the, the committee this morning about obviously the pressures that GP services are facing and the desire to hopefully try and get them back towards face to face consultations if possible with patients. Therefore, um, the need for additional vaccinators is there. And, and I look towards could you maybe give us clarity as, for example, the MOD that we, we welcome the, the deployment of certain MOD officials here in Northern Ireland to, to help with the COVID-19 battle. Has there been anything looked at in relation to vaccination programme and MOD support, given their logistical expertise? But also community pharmacists. Community pharmacists are already playing a crucial role in relation to the flu vaccine programme. We welcome that. But there is my understanding, speaking to pharmacists, there is that desire, keen desire, 
to help with the COVID-19 vaccination programme. They're well equipped to do so, uh, and I would encourage you to engage with them. I, I, I take it you already have, but I have been faced with the, the kickback on that, that they're helping with flu vaccination, and therefore uh, they're not needed at this time in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine. I think that is something that needs further ex exploration, uh, and as we move from supply to distribution, these parts of the supply chain and will, be, will be crucial to getting as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Jonathan, you have a number of questions for me. If I start with the last one. Uh, first, uh, we have engaged um, at all levels with community pharmacy. There is not enough vaccine for them to begin um, uh, the important role that they have, but we're working on a program whereby they can try and develop some use of the Pfizer vaccine, the more difficult vaccine, um, because we have more supplies of that coming in the month ahead. Um, and when there are larger supplies of the AstraZeneca vaccine, that's a very adaptable vaccine uh, to be used within the pharmacy environment. Um, but our priority right now, because we're working through the large trust vaccination uh, centers and the mobile teams and the GP practices, um, that is to focus the vaccine in those directions because they're dealing uh, with those uh, priority populations. Um, so we're, we're um, accepting of and uh, enthusiastic about the, the uh, pharmacy input to the vaccine program. And our pharmacy colleagues, both at the board and the department, are working with the leadership among that group. Um, I, I, let me flip back then to the beginning of your questions, as I understand it. Uh, we get indicative um, delivery schedules for the month ahead. Uh, we find the closer it gets, the more that changes. Sometimes goes slightly up, slightly down, um, and they batch things, uh, some delivery schedules together. Uh, as it's looking at us, um, we've two different streams. One is the AstraZeneca stream, and as it comes forward, we understand that we will have enough to vaccinate the over 75s by the end of uh, end of January, and we will have enough to start working in those um, uh, groups from three to six. I think it would be misleading uh, for me to give you detailed information about it, apart from that it's, it may be commercially sensitive for the um, distributors themselves or the vaccin vaccination uh, uh, manufacturers themselves. The other uh, uh, principal issue is that it may not be exactly as I would set it out today for you. But we also have some vaccine coming from Pfizer, very steady supplies from Pfizer, as you know, it's been uh, licensed uh, in December, therefore has a well-established manufacturing um, rollout. AstraZeneca has more recently uh, um, established. So, so far, we've only had two deliveries from um, AstraZeneca, which has allowed us to vaccinate those important uh, over 80s and then starting on the over 75s. Um, but we believe that we're going to get a steady supply. I can't be exact with you about it. This is part of, I think, to in answer to one of the earlier questions. This is the art and the, as well as the science of working with the GPs that uh, we will not know um, exactly until potentially a week before. So although we've got that indicative schedule, uh, that's the way it is. But we're, we're, we're using it as fast as we are um, engaging with it. Um, we have within the trust programs 550 um, vaccinators working within vaccine, uh, vaccine centers. But I think I reported to you earlier, we have um, upwards of 800 um, available to us um, that we are rotating in and out of that program. There are 321 GP practices that would be vaccinators within those. I wouldn't have the detail to hand of how many vaccinators. We also have an additional pool, uh, the regional pool that we've got up to 100 people that are through and ready, and we've got many more that are in the, in the process um, uh, of that. We have no shortage of vaccinators. That is not what is holding us back. The, any um, restrictions uh, will be on the uh, uh, vaccine itself, and the key issue for us uh, will not be running 24-hour centres. We do not need assistance from outside. We do not need uh, those additional vaccinators. We need more vaccine. Well, if it does come a case that supply uh, does indeed increase in the way that you anticipate, I think it would be imperative for the committee to be given the earliest opportunity as to the quantity supplied so that we can properly scrutinise the programme as it's developed. Uh, if it ever did get to a case where supply was, uh, was so good 
that we could get to a stage where 24-7 vaccination centres were appropriate. I think that's something that, that should be pressed upon. I know it's happened in other countries around the world, and indeed, all of our desire, and I'm sure yours principally, is to try and deliver a programme as quickly and as safely as possible uh, to allow, in some regard, society to return to some normality. Thank okay. Thank, thank you, John. Yeah, um, I'll take that as a, as a comment there. And if you want to say something that, uh, uh, Patty or Patricia, you can. But I'll bring in our Leah Flynn for her question then. Or Leah, go ahead. Thanks very much. Um, Patricia, maybe just to follow up a wee bit on one of the points that Jonathan made. So on the issue of community pharmacy, um, helping out with the vaccination programme, um, because obviously that will be a beneficial addition um, to, to, to the programme that you are rolling out. So you have mentioned that you are um, working on a programme for the Visor vaccine, that maybe community pharmacists can assist and help in that. And did I catch you right that that, that may be rolled out um, with that community pharmacy support next month? Or do you have any sort of firm tech deals when you will start to introduce the community pharmacists to give you a hand? Uh, uh, thank you very much. And can I just follow on the last uh, comment to say, if there's any ideas that would get this vaccine out quicker, we'll take them. We'll do them. We'll think of everything. So I, I, uh, I think we're happy to be pressed. We're happy to have suggestions made, and we're happy to look at what works anywhere um, uh, for us. And so for community pharmacy, I think I gave it my way as an example. It is a difficult vaccine. It comes in very large packs, so it would not be suitable for a lot of local uh, community pharmacists to use. So it may only be those larger companies. And I think there's some discussion underway. And that would be it's probably a four to six week lead in before they could get the systems in place um, because of the technical challenges in doing that and also been able to collect the good data on who to call and how to call and how to record that. Um, but once the other easier vaccines are more available. We don't expect that to be in February. We expect from our indicative um, delivery schedules that we will only have enough to do the program that as it's running, but it will be after that time. So we don't expect it potentially before Mar March. But if anything happens to improve our supply, if anything happens to improve our opportunities, we pull things forward. So we're, we're happy to, to kind of do that. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah. And my final point, um, Jerry had touched on it earlier around the special um, educational needs teachers who are obviously to be fair to them are, are um, in a similar vein working on the front line with, with um, children with complex needs. And I'm just wondering, you have mentioned, so obviously there is an ongoing review about who's being vaccinated and when. Um, I have been contacted by some um, special educational needs teachers who have sort of felt a wee bit frustrated um, that they haven't received the vaccine yet and had commented that you know there, there there may be some staff that have received vaccinations who are actually working exclusively full time from their homes um so i'm just wondering if any of that feedback has been fed in after your review, review, review group thank you patricia uh, thank you uh, orla um uh, we we get information all the time we get uh, comments all the time we get people asking questions all the time so we are aware of those kind of issues jcbi are considering teachers as a as an entire cohort they are aware of the issues around special schools so we're waiting for further advice on that and i, I think it is always difficult when individuals look and think that they are a higher priority than other others who've got the vaccine and and uh, and it can be very frustrating for them when that's the case when they look at the job that they do but some of the people who have been vaccinated who might be working from home might be part of an important um supply line within health and social care that would have a crucial role that in fact the service couldn't be del delivered uh, within without uh, the, uh, their role within health and social care so it is not always easy to understand why other people would have a priority, but you, there's usually and there will be a very, very good reason. Um, and that isn't to say there aren't mistakes made. Um, yes, of course there are, but we would hope those would be marginal and we wouldn't want to create a sense of, of unfairness or unhappiness. But we've really tried as rigorously as possible to make sure that we stick to those priority groups and that way it makes it fair for everybody. That's very helpful. Thank you, Patricia. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. And going then across to Alan in the uh, in the Senate chamber. And Alan, just to advise, I think from the chamber the volume is quite quite high. It's good. It's good volume, but it's picking up everything. So if you just uh, be be careful of hand movements or whatever, it's feeding into the system. But go ahead, Alan, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, Patricia, for your attendance this morning. I, I realise this is a, a massive and a totally unprecedented uh, undertaking, and congratulations to you and all involved, right down to those applying the injections for a, a job well done to date. And I'm sure there will be frustrations along the way, but I'm, I'm confident that we will get there uh, in the end. Um, I had a constituent this morning uh, draw a case to me of his mother, who is 83 years of age, can't get out of home. She's just been released from hospital. Can't get out uh, to one of the vaccination clinics or, or to the GP surgery uh, to get uh, uh, vaccinated. And uh, he uh, drew my attention that there is the creation of roving uh, groups uh, of um, vaccinators. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, if we could have an update on that and how someone would actually avail of that service. Do, do they have to contact their GP or is there another point of contact? And my second question would be, uh, do you anticipate any short-term interruption to the pace of the vaccine programme due to supply issues of the vaccine? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I can understand your constituents' concern uh, about uh, getting their vulnerable um, family member vaccinated. People who are in their own home will be vaccinated through the GP programme, either by the GP themselves uh, or by a district nurse. So I suppose it was rather fanciful term to call them roving teams, but in fact, they're the individuals who will be traveling around and vaccinating uh, individuals. They haven't been able to do it up to this point. I think I mentioned earlier that we needed to take advice about how uh, punctured um, bile could be safely transported, kept within the cold chain, and uh, uh, also using the infection prevention control measures. So that advice is now available. So GPs uh, and district nurses should now be in the position to contact those individuals. Um, the individual doesn't need to raise it. Uh, the practice will be aware of the individual and they will get out to them. So that I hope that should happen uh, within the next week uh, and the individual will feel much uh, kind of safer. If I go to the issue of vaccine supply, I'd be a very foolish woman if I said uh, there are no issues about it. There will always potentially be issues about it. Uh, we keep an eye on it. Um, we continually update and revise our plans on the basis of it. So um, at this moment in time, I am cautiously optimistic, but always with an eye to um, any potential problems. And we're always looking at what the contingency plan might be if, if that was the case. So we will keep you uh, uh, appraised of any uh, problems that we see in it, but it's a kind of we're in the, the we're in the steady stage here uh, at the moment, rather than uh, accelerating through lots of available vaccines. So it's it's steady rather than anything else at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And finally, then Paula. Paula, go ahead, please. Um, good, good afternoon now. Um, thank you, Patricia, for your contribution this morning. I purposely went last because I had a long list and thankfully you've, you've covered everything apart from two questions for me. Um, well, the first one very much actually picks up on um, the issue that Pam raised around carers. That this morning was the first time that I had heard that carers of under 16 CEV um, were actually going to be included in that. Many of the constituents who've contacted me are saying when they contact their GP surgery, they're not even um, aware that um, they will be under um, priority six. There's still a bit of a question over whether care partners will be uh, included and many other carers who, as you know, are very vulnerable, very isolated and are looking for answers at the minute um, and they're not getting their GPs. Obviously, they're very overworked. Is there any chance that you could pull together a single leaflet to outline for carers how and when they are going to be vaccinated and their loved ones. They've had 11 months of pure stress and anxiety, and I think that that would be very, very welcomed. Uh, thank you, Paula. Um, I did make some statements yesterday specifically about CARES because I've become aware that this was an emerging issue. Um, well, GPs are focused now on the 
80 year olds and above, and they're starting to consider the 75 and the over 74s, they would not be quite as well aware of all the other parts of the program, given that we're only starting to work these through. Um, we're going to work with our social care colleagues um, to look at that um, wider group of carers. We are uh, looking at those who've got um, uh, carers alliance. We're looking at those who are care partners. We're looking at those who have cares um, uh, uh, care uh, assessments have been made for. So we're carefully working our way through that. We expect them, uh, as advised by JCVI, that they would be part of the priority group. So, um, we uh, are, are looking, I think, to assess the size that population might be. Um, because we may need to look at supplementing the, the GP program to enable that uh, to be able to be delivered uh, effectively um, at the right kind of time. So uh, your advice is very welcome about specifically, Flit, about carers. We haven't yet at that moment in time um, uh, done that, but we certainly will take that advice. Um, thank you very much. Um, the second question is around the, the people who work in the COVID testing centre. I, I'm not sure whether it's every COVID um, testing centre, but I was aware that one, um, that the people who are operating it have not been vaccinated. Can you please give me an understanding of when they will, because obviously they're, they're a very vulnerable group. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think that's one of the groups that's either just been called forward or about to be called forward in the final um uh, in that final staff uh, group, because uh, you can imagine that we we started with the frontline staff in hospitals and have worked our way steadily through. So we've vaccinated nearly, um, I think, 100,000 people within that uh, cohort. So we're just about to get to them. So they are on the list and we will get to them if we haven't already started. Oh, thank you so much, Patricia. That's great. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, that's been a very useful update in relation to the programme, and I do uh, I do want to concur with with members' comments in relation to the, uh, the 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 significant successes to date and the amount of significant effort that has gone into that. And indeed, your own engagement with the committee here on a regular basis has been welcome. Um, so I want to thank you for that, and also um, just just a very uh, quick final comment really around. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll make it a, qu a quick question. Um, is there work ongoing with community settings in the expectation that we may get further uh, availability of supply? So is there contingency work that can be done in preparing community groups, you know, in terms of so that when the supply comes available, we're not then starting to the train or indeed providing freezers in, in strategic locations that might accommodate the rollout of additional rollout? Is that ongoing? Well, we always keep it under review and um, we work with the support of our community colleagues and we have members of the council and the leads within Northern Ireland who sit on quite a number of our groups and they're aware of our planning. They are always making good suggestions and they're aware of the, 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 the potential that we would open other centres. So they're working very closely with us and we're looking at um, the volunteer sector of how they can support it because there's roles other than uh, just vaccinators you'll understand if you're bringing a large number of people you have to keep them socially distant you have to make sure they park safely and all of those things so we're always keeping that under um uh consideration and we are looking um and it's probably beyond february um chair uh to when there might be more vaccine available that we will ramp up and uh, so we're preparing that at this moment in time yeah Thank you, and I appreciate that. And I know there are there are sporting organisations, GA clubs involved in the testing thing. Several across again across the north, many of them have contacted me to say they would be delighted to help out with the vaccination program. So I know that sporting organisations, particularly, and there's I think it it improves the whole community by in the sense of social solidarity as well when you're when you're doing it on a community level like that. So I would welcome any developments in that. But listen, thank you for that, sure. Patricia, and good luck in the time ahead uh, with with the obviously. The very important work. It is indeed, indeed, a significant element of the of the uh, of the reaction, along with all of the find, test, trace, and all of those other measures, which remain until such times as as we can eliminate this. Th those remain key elements, along with with the vaccine. So, thank you for that, and thank you for attending our committee this morning. All thank the you. best. Apologies, apologies for the sound quality. Not sure. I'll try and fix that for the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. um, members, sure. thank you for that. So, Can you hear me now? Um, members, we're going now to, we have a number of, of uh, 
SRs. Just uh, allow me to check something here. Chair, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, Jonathan, yeah, go ahead. No, sorry, I just I wanted to say before Patricia left, but perhaps you could maybe pass it on. Um, she provided a very useful graph there and some statistics that aren't in the pack. It would be useful for committee members to receive that. It was in relation to number of vaccines supplied, etc. Uh, I know that's a rolling thing, but I, I think that sort of graph data surely we as a committee should be receiving that as that's I guess from what you're saying that's rolled out every day I don't see why the committee couldn't get a copy of that yep we, we will we will ask for that to be forwarded yep. Chair, Chair, yes that, yeah I keep getting the camera wrong. Um, it was actually emailed out um, mid-morning Jonathan you maybe just haven't checked your inbox I haven't, so no. we didn't have that's brilliant if that's the case, no. Okay. Maybe, maybe just this one, Paula, or maybe if they're doing that daily or whatever, maybe we could put a request for for that email to be sent. But I haven't looked at my emails today because I've been on the committee. Yeah, Thanks. no, no. I, I think it was just what um, Patricia referred to this morning. But I totally agree with it. It'd be good to have a regular um, supply of that. Thank you. Yeah, that, yeah we, we will ask that. There's a couple of other items of correspondence in members relating to the vaccine, which I just want to deal with now before we move on to the SRs. So are members content to note the correspondence from the, the BDA, the British Dental Association, regarding COVID-19, which is included in the packet 6.2? Are members content to note that correspondence? Yeah. Members content, thank you. Um, and are members content to note correspondence at tab 6.4 of table papers from the Committee for Education regarding prioritisation of COVID-19 vaccination for staff in schools and special schools? And I know we have, we have touched on that a, a number of times this morning, but are members content to note that correspondence? Yes, members Chair. are content. Yeah, go ahead, Pam. Yeah, yeah thank you, Chair. Uh, just to say... Yeah, we did touch on that, and I think I would like to just put on record, and maybe we should send our thanks through to Patricia. I think that was a really, really good session, and I think she was very forthcoming, and she gave us any information that she had, whether it was in her remit or not. I think it was most helpful, and it'll probably be very enlightening for all those questions out there in the community as well. So I wanted to pass on, on thanks to her for that. But I think, yes, the issue around, especially around special educational needs and those clinical clinic extremely vulnerable children it's good to know that actually jcvi are continually looking at this issue and, and let's hope that um that that something comes out of that because we completely understand where the minister's coming from where he doesn't want to be uh, pushing people down the vaccination list list who are who are vulnerable and um, none of us want that either but i think it is important that, that we look out for those children who, who can't be vaccinated this at this time or that still be considered so just want to put that on record thanks Thank you, Deputy Chair. And I just want to clarify, I should have said there in relation to the first item of correspondence, it's the British Association for Private Dentists. I had said BDA incorrectly, so it's the British Association for Private Dentists, but I think members would still be content to note on that basis. Okay, members, thank you for that. We are going to move on then to a number of SRs, which we, we need to deal with before we move to our, to our committee. Are you, ahead, Pat? Are you, are you finished ahead, with Pat? correspondence? Finish with what, Pat? The correspondence. No, we, no, no, we're only dealing with those items that relate to vaccines. We will be coming back to the main correspondence section. No bother. Okay, okay members, so moving on then to, to uh, statutory rules. You recall, members, the committee deferred its consideration of two of the statutory rules regarding travel restrictions at last week's meeting. Uh, that was in order to seek information from the department on the evidence behind the reduction in the self-isolation period from 14 to 10 days. The department has now advised that the decision to move from 14 to 10 days was made by the uh, four CMOs having considered the available scientific evidence. On Pat, can, I think you're maybe not on mute, Pat, there. We're hearing a bit of paper. So, uh, that, that decision was made by the four CMOs having considered the available scientific evidence on viral shredding and infectiousness and the behavioural evidence on adherence to self-isolation and that this is consistent with a number of other countries. The department further advised that decisions of this nature are made by respective uh, professional advisors across, the, across the, the North England, Scotland, Wales and policy leads and informed by the evidence provided by their respective health bodies. 
The department has provided a link there to an academic article from the British Medical Journal on the incubation period of COVID-19, which it advises is indicative of the research informing the reduction of quarantine to 10 days. And that article is included at tab 7.6 of your table papers. So just to check, do members have any further issues to raise in relation to those statutory rules if we, if we, uh, before we go to the formal consideration? Uh, Jerry, I see a hand indicating, is that in relation to the statutory rule? Yeah, sure, thanks. It's uh, 3T5 and 3T6, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I looked through the, um, the academic journal and uh, I think uh, uh, I'm more confused in a way, maybe that's just my reading of it, uh, in the sense that um, I think it was limited data to kind of defend uh, the reduction from 14 to 10. And I think obviously, it's worth saying nobody wants to keep people isolated for longer than necessary. But my, my concern, Chair, um, uh, last week was that um, we could be rushed into making this decision. Um, I mean, the fact that last week we weren't really presented with any rationale uh, at all, uh, bar, the, bar the statement or the comment, rather, that the CMOs uh, kind of uh, endorsed it is very, very worrying. So, uh, and, and my understanding, Chair, is, is the, um, the issue around, there's an issue around compliance, that there's a perception or a belief that compliance kind of maybe uh, wanes after uh, seven or eight days or whatever the, the day is. But that's uh, in part down to people being financially concerned and not having enough protection, uh, um, being off from work uh, and that. So I just don't think there's concern with this, Chair. I mean, I don't have obviously a wealth of medical uh, to back up my, my concern, but I think uh, the fact that we were kind of led to just go along with, with it because other reasons had the very least caused this for um, for me to, to kind of stop and think about it at least. So I still have those concerns. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. And and I am conscious we are we are having the minister with us on the eleventh of February. And this this SR, like so many of the other ones, have wider issues going on. And and I suppose the uh, the the potential for upheaval or confusion around some of the other issues that are involved. It's not just the the isolation issue. Um, and I think we would want to we would want to. Um, certainly, drill in further to it. Um, you know, the reading, the reading, some of the reading that I have been doing in the past while has indicated that that it, it does uh, reinforce compliance and leaves it easier for people who are who are struggling to apply that. And I think I think that that isolation is still something more broadly that we need to provide more support for people with with COVID nineteen. Any other comments from members in relation to the SR? And and this is our last opportunity to discuss these SRs. But is there any other? Uh, views or, or questions or points from any other members? Sure, uh, yeah. No. Sorry, somebody else? In? Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Go ahead, Jonathan. This is in relation to SR uh, 2023 25 and 326, yes. Um, no, I suppose yes, probably. Yes, I know they're the only. Yeah, I suppose I'm probably not. just. Um, you know, the fact that, it's, and, it's, and I've seen it there, that, that only two people arriving in Northern Ireland through, through Dublin from Denmark contacted PHA. Perhaps illustrates there's need for better information sharing, and maybe that was mentioned whenever I had to do a comfort break there. But um, it's certainly something that should should be raised. And also, um, you know, how will enforcement of pre-arrival testing differ from current enforcement of failure to self-isolate? It just it just seems uh, that it's it's not very clear. I know we we'll probably don't have an official on the line probably in relation to this. Well, we do have an official on standby. Um, we do have an official on standby who we can possibly get in in relation to that question. Um, I'm just going to check with with the clerk here. We also have a session with the two CMOs planned, Jonathan. And I well, think no, there no, is I'm a key point I'm, there. You know, I'm happy to coordinate. Yeah, no, I'm happy to hold that off. To that it's just questions around that particular regulation. Uh, you know, that I think probably the, I know it has been raised on numerous occasions regarding information sharing. So, look, I, I'm happy to, to leave those questions until we get a briefing from them directly. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, I don't see any other indication, so I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, put the the questions formally to the meeting. So, SR twenty twenty forward slash three two five. I refer members there to tab seven of the pack. Um, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 
forward slash 325, the health protection, coronavirus, public health advice for persons traveling to NA number two amendment regulations, NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, members, yeah. Agreed, okay, thank you. Moving on to uh, SR 2020 forward slash 326. Um, I refer members to tab papers at tab eight of the pack and table papers. Um, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 326, the Health Prevention Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment number 25 regulations NA 2020 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yeah, I think we are agreed. Thank you, members. Okay, members, moving on then um, to items 9 and 10 there. Uh, so those are both food standards agency statutory rules. Um, the second rule actually revokes the first rule in this case. So members, uh, hope members may, I'd like to check if members are content to hold any questions until the replacement SR is laid. So essentially, we're not dealing with an SR that's going to be laid here. There was one led, it's now being revoked, and the second one we're considering in this section is the one that revokes it, and we will then have, have officials attending to, to uh, outline the new SR. So are members content to proceed on that basis? Yeah. So I refer members to tab 9 of your pack there for SR 2020 forward slash 310. The Food Standard Agency has advised that this SR contains drafting errors and has been revoked. The FSA further advised that the SL1 for the replacement SR will be with the committee in the next few weeks. Are members content to note that? Yeah. Thank you, members. Uh, SR 2020 forward slash 341. The Food Standards Agency advises this SR revokes the previous one I just mentioned, uh, which is SR 2020 forward slash 310. The examiner of statutory rules has advised that the rule was laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content that a, sac a satisfactory explanation has been given. Uh, have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, thank you, members. So then, uh, if not, can I ask members to agree formally then that the Committee for Health has considered the addition of vitamins, minerals, and other substances amendment revocation regulations NA 2020 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yeah. Okay. Members agree. Thank you. Moving on then, members to item uh, 12, 11 and 12. Um, the next two agenda items are health protection statutory rules. So can I advise members of departmental officials are here to brief the committee on the provisions of these SRs? So I would now like to welcome, I hope we have uh, with us here, Ms. Liz Redmond, who is Director of Population Health, and Ms. Marianne McKeever from the Health Protection Branch, who are both joining us by video link. Uh, can I ask broadcasting that those, those, uh, those officials be brought into the spotlight? Or do we need to take a short break, Clerk, to facilitate the... Can you hear us at all? Yeah. Can you hear yes. us? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you, yeah. yeah. You I'm can. not seeing you so far, but I am, I am hearing, but not, not seeing you so far. Who's that? Uh, is that Liz? It's Maybe? Liz uh, and Marion McKeever. Okay, uh, I think you're coming up, up onto the spotlight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go sure. ahead, Liz, please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Look, thanks for inviting us um, today to attend your meeting and brief you on these uh, two statutory rules. We're today considering number 24 and 25 amendments to the coronavirus restrictions number two regulations. Um, if you're content, I'll just set a bit of context and briefly summarise both these statutory rules and then Marion and I can um, answer any questions you have. Is that okay if I just get off on that? Liz, can I just, can I just check with you, Liz? Um, your your camera's not doesn't appear to be working. Is your camera switched on at, at your end? We're just seeing a blank screen here at our end. Right. And also, Jerry, if I could ask you to, to uh, take your hand down, Jerry, just so that I don't no, get. Uh, yeah. Can you see us so now? I'm still I'm still not seeing you there now. No, just ah. just. Uh, 
We're hearing you clearly enough, and we, we can proceed. We can proceed if, if we don't get to see you. That's fine. We can proceed. But I'm just trying to give broadcasting a minute or two to see if we can get the. Uh, your your camera's not switched off at your end, Liz, is it? No, we we just I just experimented, switched it off and on, and when it comes on, we can see ourselves. So okay. um, it, it's definitely on. Okay, um, and I wonder, is the case that you need to reverse the, the, the camera, is that possibly the case? Sure. Anyway, let's, no, we, we, are hearing you, we are hearing you clearly enough, um, and I, 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 maybe it's only me that can't see you, but I think we can go ahead with, with the briefing on, based on the fact that we can hear you clearly. Yeah, All right. go well, ahead with, well, with audio. Well, go ahead, okay. Um, so uh, you'll recall um, from last week, uh, we talked to the committee about easing of restrictions that took effect from the 11th of December. So those permitted the reopening of places of worship, non-essential businesses, including non-essential retail, close contact service, driving, instruction, uh, various leisure and entertainment venues, including museums, galleries, libraries, and so on. Most of the hospitality industry had reopened at that point with the exception of traditional non-food pubs uh, outdoor sporting activity had largely reopened although with a limit on numbers and restrictions remained for out indoor sport um, Liz, so the sorry for, sorry for, Liz you're, you're a bit faint for members I'm hearing you quite clearly but some members are so if you can just speak a little louder or if you can turn your volume up a little that'll be appreciated will do uh, can you hear me a bit bit better now if I so shout a little more yeah I okay. think that's a bit better yeah okay um, so uh, we, we did have still things remaining closed from the 11th of December, um, which included the traditional non-food pubs, concert halls and theatres, conference centres and nightclubs. They did remain closed and there were still restrictions on household gatherings. So that's where we were at that time. And the number R was below one. Um, uh, there had been a decline in the number of cases and hospital emissions and ICU occupancy. Um, and it was anticipated that numbers would decline slightly but remain relatively stable until shortly before Christmas. However, the modelling of the epidemic at that time did anticipate that cases of COVID-19 would begin to increase again as soon as those restrictions were relaxed in December. And if the R value were to rise as high as 1.8, then additional restrictions would, would be required around Christmas time. That was predicted. So at the executive meeting on the 17th of December, the health minister presented updated modelling and he advised that those models were projecting that the reproductive rate of the virus, that's the R value, would shortly be between 1.4 and 1.8, leading to a significant rise in the number of COVID-19 cases on top of the existing high baseline of cases. He therefore strongly recommended that a reintroduction of restrictions should be urgently considered to prevent the hospital system being overwhelmed once again. The executive agreed to a period of tighter restrictions similar to those that were in place during the two week circuit breaker from the 27th of November to the 10th of December with some modifications aimed at further enhancing those areas where compliance may have been low. For example, non-essential click and collect services would not be permitted. There would be also closure of some businesses that had previously been allowed to open under the essential retail category during earlier restrictions, uh, including garden centres and homeware stores. So that's just, just really setting out the background to get us to uh, the 26th of December. Um, and I'm now going to summarise the two uh, amendment regulations we're discussing today, which were brought into effect um, restrictions from the 26th of December, which are currently still in place. So starting with SR 2020-356, that's the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 24, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. This SR was made at 2 p.m. on the 24th of December 2020. These regulations came into operation at midnight on the 25th of December and remain in place today. These regulations introduced the following. Closure of non-essential retail businesses, including click and collect services. Closure of close contact services, including driving instruction with some exemptions. Closure of indoor and outdoor visitor attractions and sports and leisure facilities. 
indoor and outdoor gatherings in private dwellings uh, limited to members of one household and their linked household, a maximum of 10 people, including children under uh, age 12 or under from two linked households can gather indoors or outdoors at a private dwelling at any one time. Indoor and outdoor gatherings excluding private dwellings are only permitted up to a maximum of 15 people including children age 12 and under and risk assessments are not permitted to allow larger gatherings at this time although exemptions apply for work, blood donations, vaccinations, education and so on. There are restrictions on sporting events. Indoor um, sport is only permitted for elite athletes or for physical education in schools. Outdoor gatherings for the purposes of exercise or sport are only permitted for elite athletes, physical education in or for schools. If participants are members of the same household or linked households, or if exercise is taken by an individual and their carer or carers. Spectators are not permitted. Businesses selling food, drink and intoxicating liquor for consumption on the premises must cease to do business but may sell food and drink including intoxicating liquor for consumption off the premises. Any intoxicating liquor must be sold or provided in the manufacturer's original sealed packaging. Now, additional restrictions were uh, put in place between the hours of 8pm and 6am for a limited period from the 26th of December to one minute past midnight on the 2nd of January. These prevented household mixing in private gardens or indoors in any private dwelling except for emergencies or for the provision of health or care services. These restrictions also applied to gatherings with linked or bubbled households. Indoor or outdoor gatherings generally with members of more than one household were not allowed. Indoor and outdoor sporting events were not allowed between the hours of 6 and 8, 6 a.m. and um, 8 p oh, so actually should be 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, with the exception of training for uh, by elite athletes, exercise taken by members of your own household or linked household, or exercise by an individual with their carer or carers. Essential retail could not operate except for deliveries of groceries only or click and collect of groceries on an appointment only basis. Hospitality could not operate between these times, including deliveries for that very restricted period of the 26th of December to the 2nd of January. So I'll move on now to the second of the two statutory rules we're discussing today. That's SR 2020-358, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2 Amendment Number 25 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, this statutory rule was made at, at 7pm on the 29th of December 2020. These regulations came into operation at the same time and day that they were made and are still effective now. These regulations made the following changes. They amended the text to permit taxi or vehicle hire businesses to operate during the period of tighter restrictions between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. from the 26th of December until the 2nd of January 2021. More, they more clearly defined the operating hours of businesses selling food and drink to prevent businesses from flouting the regulations by taking orders prior to 11 p.m. but continuing to operate by delivery into the early hours of the morning. And they provided that the power to require people to return home would operate only up until the 2nd of January 2021. So I hope uh, that that just provides you with a summary of the contexts in which these regulations were made and a little bit of an outline of their content. Very happy to take questions. Uh, members will be aware that the scope of these reg regulations is far reaching across the responsibilities of many executive departments. So if we're unable to provide an answer, we're very happy to seek um, clarification from our colleagues in other departments subsequent to the meeting. Thank you. Hey. Okay, thank you, Liz. Thank you for that. And I will then just go across to members to check if members, any members do have any questions for the officials in relation to these two. Yes, Colin, in the room. Yeah, um, go ahead, thanks. Jonathan. No, I suppose um, these particular regulations, I suppose it's a point that I've been raising uh, over the past couple of weeks, in fact, since Boxing Day, that there is um, a perception, and I think it's well validated, by independent retail retailers that they're getting the raw end of the deal here in relation to the activities of multinationals. Um, 
I know that there has been conversations ongoing in the executive office and a working group was established <coughs> that was confirmed by the health minister and indeed uh, the first minister and deputy first minister. So have, have the contributor anything to add, to add to that in relation to where we are with it? Um, cl close contact services, like uh, something like click and collect, has there been anything that's con been considered to either make it a level playing field by levelling it up are levelling it down. I think it's unfair and it's something that the committee needs to continue to press upon. So I wondered if there was any update in relation to that. Okay, Liz, go ahead, please. Um, you're correct that there are active discussions ongoing around this. Um, at this point in time, I can't report uh, any outcome that's going to lead to a change in the regulations, but um, you've outlined the issues that are under active consideration and discussion. And, and I'm, I would also add that in light of what's before us, and I think it would be important for us to hear fully uh, the outworkings of that working group, um, I suppose I have a lot of sympathy for the arguments put forward by Domino's, and I suppose not many people would realise that they've been delivering significant numbers of orders to our frontline workers in our hospitals uh, beyond the, the 11 p.m., which disproportionately affects the shift workers. So I'm very supportive of that. I was wondering, is there any other real examples of services uh, such as fast food that's being provided to our hospitals and frontline staff that have been impacted by the closure of these under time curfew? Uh, that, that isn't a, a, an issue that's been brought to my attention, um, but, but thank you for highlighting it and, and we will we'll take that away. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, going across then to Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to clarify, I might have missed it. Sorry, uh, on the deliveries after eleven o'clock uh, for food, is that still permitted uh, or still at log with these regulations? Um, the other point is around. Um, I'm here of non-essential uh, click and collect um, workplaces um, closing uh, mostly. Um, still being open. Um, do these regulations permit that or should click and collect clothing um, companies, uh, workplaces be, be closed under these regulations? Thank you. Go ahead, Liz. Okay, Marion's going to take the first question and I'll take the second one. Um, hi, uh, in relation to the deliveries, um, can you hear me okay? I'm just a wee bit further back from the, the mic. Uh, yes, um, yes, we're hearing you. We're hearing you fine. Thank you. And um, yeah, in terms of the deliveries, uh, the businesses are only permitted to operate till eleven p.m. Um, we do foresee that, you know, there would be maybe some expectation after eleven for deliveries, but that would be soon after. You know, orders couldn't be placed as they were before, which um, permitted that amendment because um, we were finding that businesses were say flouting the re regulations where they were taking orders up to the 11 but then continuing to operate into the early hours of the morning so um which wasn't in um alignment really with the policy intent so um businesses must cease to operate at 11 p.m uh, regarding the non-essential click and collect that isn't permitted this time round um, there were a lot of concerns about uh, the way uh, non-essential retail click and collect had operated previously during the restrictions um, and uh, there had been a lot of congregation of people around shopping centres which are a source of transmission and clusters and outbreaks so the decision was taken not to permit that this time. Uh, th thanks very much. Just just clarity on, on that. So just, you're telling me that so um, say shops selling clothes um, um, shouldn't be open because they're they're non essential or are they non essential? Um, and also uh, there was a bit of confusion last time around um, massage uh, therapies uh, centres being being opened or closed. And I'm, I've I've got a constituent who's um, trying to get assistance financially having to remain closed, but um, just being um, not given a, a sort of assurance on that. So is, is it the case that all, all massage 
um, institutions or, or, or places should be should be closed, even if they're providing medical um, uh, assistance as well. Is that the case? Thanks. Um, yes, uh, there, there is an exception for sports massage therapists to be open, um, but otherwise they should be closed. Also, services that are commissioned by our health and social care service are permitted to operate. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Liz and uh, Marion. I don't see any other indications there, so uh, I think we can we can uh, we can we can thank you and. Uh, we can continue on with our consideration, but we can we can let you go at that. So thank you for coming along to committee today and for your answers and presentation. Gorma, thank, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, members. Um, so we now, as as usual, uh, consider each of the SRs in turn. I can advise that both SRs are subject to confirmatory resolution. Yesterday's report from the examiner of statutory rules drew attention to drafting errors in SR 2020 forward slash 3.356 item 11, but advised that the provisions in question have since been revoked. So I'll move on to, to item 11 is SR 2020 forward slash 356, the health protection coronavirus restrictions number two, amendment number 24, regulations NA 2020. I refer members to papers at tab 11 of your pack. Can I remind members that this SR provided for the current restrictions and put a curfew in place between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. from the 26th of December to the 2nd of January? Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rules? That statutory rule? No. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 356 the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 24, Regulations NA 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, members. Uh, moving on then to the SR 2020 forward slash 358. Can I remind members that this SR made further adjustments to current restrictions as discussed and corrected some errors? So, uh, any further issues with that, uh, SR members? No, thank you. So then, can I formally uh, ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 358, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number 2, Amendment Number 25, Regulations 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Yeah, members agreed. Thank you, members. Okay, members, we're moving on then to uh, item 13, which is our committee inquiry into the impact of COVID-19 on care homes and consideration of our report. Uh, members, I now propose that we go into a closed session to consider our draft report. Are members content? Content. Content, thank you. Uh, could you press the red button, uh, Clark, please? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, at item there 14 and I refer members to the correspondence at tab 14 of your packs and to the correspondence memo at tab 14.1 um, there are a few items that I would like to draw members attention to so first of all item 14.2 is a departmental response in relation to the O'Hara report into hyponatremia related deaths um, any comment from members in relation to that Yes, Chair, I'd like to come on. Yeah, go, go ahead, Pat, yeah. Uh, I mean, this has been an ongoing issue now. I raised the, the question a number of times with the Minister, and uh, I'm sure members will have seen the publicity last week around the uh, Chief Scientific Advisor, Professor Young, uh, taking a judicial review in London uh, to try to stop the GMC investigating his role in that hyponatremia issue. Um, I, I, some serious issues have arisen as a result of that. In fact, 
it has been reported that one BBC journalist was asked by someone from within the health department to remove a tweet uh, on the basis that uh, Professor Young didn't agree with the findings of the O'Hara report. Now, there are a number of issues that are arise as a result of that. The first is my understanding was that the department uh, had accepted the entirety of the O'Hara report. That's the first issue. If, if, if there are people within the department in senior positions who disagree with that, then we, we should be made aware of it. Secondly, why would anyone in the Department of Health uh, contact a BBC journalist on behalf of Professor Young in regard to an issue that he may or may not have been involved in when he wasn't uh, directly employed by the department? Uh, I mean, I, I think there are some serious concerns here. And I mean, I would like the, the committee to get some clarity from the department around those issues. Thanks. You're on mute, Colin. Yeah, thank you, Pat. And Jonathan was indicating yeah. there as well. Go ahead, yeah, Jonathan. Yes, sure. No, I, I would concur with Pat Sheehan's comments. Uh, this is something that does indeed cause me some concern as well. Uh, and I think his points on the record in relation to... Um, what he has mentioned in relation to the removal of, of tweets or whatever it may be in relation to the case, uh, the department accepting it in its entirety. You know, there, there seems to be some element of the lines being blurred in this. And unfortunately, it, it does run the real risk of damaging public confidence, particularly at this time. So I suppose probably I would support Pat Chain in terms of bringing uh, more information from the department to us on this. You know, it, what role has the department have, financial or otherwise, in this ongoing case? Okay, members. Well, listen. Um, we do need to we do need to exercise caution in relation to uh, ongoing legal proceedings. But I think it would be um, a well. I have an indication there from Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Sorry, Chair. Um, well, it, it was pretty much covered there, and I do agree with you. We do need to exercise caution because there have heard from some journalists that when they have tried to raise issues, there have been issued with libel letters, and I think that there, there's just there's too many questions still out there, especially for the likes of Claire Roberts' family who are still 25 years on looking for answers and for um, accountability around this issue. Um, so I think that we do need an update, not just a written one, but I think that we need to look at this as an issue as um, from the Health Committee's point of view. And if it, brings, if it means bringing the Health Minister here for this issue, I think it's worth it. Okay. So... Okay, would members be content initially that we were right to the department oh, asking them I to provide further Thank clarity? Chair, uh, I'm... Uh, who's, yeah, is that Alan? Yep, yeah, go ahead, Alan. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I, I, I'm not comfortable um, talking on the record about um, what I see as, as, as a rumour about this uh, claim being made uh, about a BBC reporter. Now, it may, it may be documented and it may be already in the public domain factually, and I may be aware of it, and if that's the case, uh, I, I certainly apologise. Uh, but um, you know, if, if that is not the case, uh, I, I'm not really sure, and I'm not comfortable that we as a committee are sitting here in the public domain discussing something uh, that may be true or may not be true uh, at, at this stage. So I, I'm just wondering maybe if the Chair would rule on that. Well, I think I think what we are what we are what committee members are asking for is that we ask for clarity as to the correctness of that um, of that potential issue. Um, the, the committee members are also indicating that they would like clarity in relation to the financial role of the department. And I think I think it is reasonable that we write to the department and ask them for that clarity, and also um, that we indicate to the minister that this is an issue that may be want to, that may arise at his next appearance on the on the eleventh. And if, if required, we can look about an additional session to discuss this issue alone. Um, 
So would members be content with that that approach that we write initially and and seek clarity and and uh, then we can we can then consider how we might approach it then based on that on that clarification. Um, just, members content. Just one additional point, Colm, sorry. Um, I know the BMA are still quite keen to get a bit of clarity from the Department of Health around the proposed or the direction of travel around the individual duty of candour. And if we're indicating to the Health Minister that he may be asked about hyponatremia, if he can have an up-to-date position to provide us at that time. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think yeah. members are agreed with that. Yeah. Just, yes, go ahead, Pat. Just, just yes, yeah, yes uh, I agree with what Paula says, particularly around the issue of a duty of candor. But just come back to what Alan said there. Um, I mean, the 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 issue about uh, a journalist being asked to take a tweet down. I mean, I can't stand over the veracity of that or not. But it's important that we get confirmation from the department about whether it's true or not. Uh, we're not making any assertions that it is true, uh, but by virtue of the fact that it has been out there in public uh, and on social media, uh, we, we, we need to know if it is true and, and, and if it is true, why did it happen? And Chair, could okay. I, okay, I so add to that and, uh, from Pat Shane, if we are writing that it is in particular a question that we need to know, is the department financially supporting Dr. Young's case. I think that's important for us to know because whether or not it, there's been things said in relation to Twitter or online formats, I think as a committee we need to know uh, what the department's role is in this ongoing case. Okay. Okay, members. Thank you. I think I think that's fairly clear as to the content of that of that letter. Thank you. Okay, then members. Moving on to. Um, Moving on to item 14.9 there, which is a copy of a letter to a Mr. Jeffrey Donaldson, MP, in relation to MESH and the Cumberledge report. Um, uh, and, and linked to that is item 14.15, which is from an individual regarding sodium valproate and the Cumberledge report. So um, members will recall that the committee wrote to the department in September last year to ask for information in relation to the department's working group on the Cumberledge report recommendations. The minister did advise that he would provide a formal response when the work of the group is underway. Members will also remember that the planned informal meeting with those affected by MESH was postponed due to COVID-19. So have members any other comment they wish to make in relation to either of those two items on, in, in link to the Cumberledge report? Um, okay, okay. Um, item 14.16 then is from an individual seeking committee support for his request for an independent review into the closure of the, the Valley Nursing Home. Um, so I'm happy to take comments from members, um, but I am conscious that, that uh, we have agreed on, on many occasions that any issues that we look at would be regional in nature, right, right across the north, rather than specific individual cases. So in light of that, um, I do wonder if members think it would be best in terms of committee time if individual MLAs, and I know some of you are engaged with, with this particular, and, and I am myself, too. Just to indicate that as, a, as an interest, I have been extensively involved in relation to that myself. But I wonder, would, it, would members be content that individual MLAs continue to deal with that issue rather than a, an individual home being dealt with by the committee? Would members be content with that? Yeah. Okay, members are content with that. Um, Chair, sorry. I'd, Yep, go ahead, Pam. Sorry, Chair, it was just on 14.9 on the, on the MESH issue. What, what have we agreed to do with that? Well, um, I wonder, I wonder would, would members agree that we go ahead and arrange a Zoom meeting with those affected by MESH, maybe to try to get an idea ourselves as to where, where the issues are at? Would that be a proposed action coming out of that? Yep. So an informal, uh, arrange a Zoom with those. Would members Chair, be content with that? I know, I know Paul has indicated there that we could hear from because um, I know certain members who were on, have been more involved in this issue, certainly than I have, I would very much welcome that. Um, uh, some kind of briefing or an update on the whole issue to get the full picture because it seems um, pretty horrible for those involved. So I think it's important that we do do that and that it's a priority. 
Okay, members agreed that we 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 start the start the proceeding. Yes, go ahead, Paula. I've just to, to um, we could either have it individually or together, but I do think there is a distinction between the vaginal mesh implants and the hernia mesh implants in terms of the services. And I think that there's enough information within both groups, so it might be potentially two Zoom meetings back to back. But I, I do think that we need to make sure that the mesh, sorry, the hernia mesh are in there as well. Thank you. Okay. And and similar to how we have managed this in the past, do do a couple or, or three members want to indicate that, that they would be willing to arrange that meeting and facilitate for other members? Then, um, would would could members indicate that they're willing to do that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Paula true. and yeah. Pam, yeah, yeah, Thank and you. and I know Aaliyah has been has been uh, engaged with the group with those groups quite extensively as well. So maybe if you could arrange that meeting and then uh, open that up for other members to attend, we can get an update. And, and decide then how we move forward. Okay, thank you, members. And just to reiterate on the on the on the Valley Home, we ha we are agreed that uh, uh, members individually will continue to to work with that uh, with that group in relation to the Tlahar Valley Home. Thank you. So moving on then, yes, Paula. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Moving. Okay. So. Um, Have members any comments or proposals on any other items of correspondence there in the in the t this week's correspondence? Go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for interrupting you there. It was more just some concern about the um, list, the long, long list at the back of the correspondence pack of um, letters that haven't been responded to. I'm just wondering what the clerk's experience is in terms of trying to chase that up. Um, I appreciate the health department are very much under pressure, but some of these issues are dating back as far as August. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it is it is it possible to give us an update, Clerk, or do you, do you wish to? Uh, is is it possible to give us any further information on some of those outstanding items of correspondence and questions to the department? Uh, I, what what I can advise members is that this list is chased up uh, weekly between the Dallow and the committee team, and I will report back to the department that obviously the, this concern has been expressed today and see if that will shift things on a bit, but I'm not in a position to advise you further on any particular items at this time. But I'll try to make sure we have some more information for next week. Okay. Okay, thank you. And then are members otherwise then content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Uh, just a, yeah. a chair. Members just content. What, thank uh, uh, Alan here, just one thing if I could uh, yes, maybe Alan. raise. Uh, chair, it's the... Uh, 14.13 about the post-COVID support, the letter that we received. I know that uh, I, I uh, raised this uh, uh, last week at the committee, um, and in the meantime, uh, I know that some individual members and indeed other MLAs have uh, posed questions, uh, written questions to the Health Minister uh, about the uh, situation around this uh, long COVID. Um, I'm just wondering, Chair, if we could, I'm not sure, maybe the clerk already has some action in mind, but if we could perhaps um, correspond with the, the Health Minister and ask just for an update. I know that he did respond to uh, a written question from one of my colleagues back in October about the very subject and said that they, they were aware uh, that there was accumulation of, of evidence that, that, that this uh, long COVID was a very real ailment and that they were doing research into it uh, with a view to you know, how they would move forward with it. So uh, if I could maybe propose, if, if it's not already been done, that we write to the Minister just and ask him for an update on what uh, plans his department might have to offer support to those who are suffering from this long COVID. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm being advised, Alan, that the committee has written on this, so I think we're awaiting a response. I think we have already asked for an update on that, and and are awaiting a response. So if you're content, we'll, are you content for us I'm to make that, that thanks, response sir. and see where that takes us? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members. Moving on then to um, the forward. Our members, yeah, otherwise content. Uh, that has been agreed. Moving on then, members, to the forward work program. Item 15 there, can I refer members to the draft forward work program at tab 15.1 of the pack? By way of update, I can advise members that the Minister's next session with the committee has been scheduled for the 11th of February, just to formally. And are otherwise, are members content to note the forward work program then, as presented? Yeah, agreed. Thank you, members. 
So moving on then, members, to any other business. Do members have any other business for the meeting today? And Jonathan, I know you had indicated something Th- there. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. Um, it's in relation to Unison's public commentary surrounding the military support in our hospitals. It's rightly caused a lot of concern, both from its members and indeed the wider public. At a time when we should be calling for all the help we can get, I, I'm absolutely flabbergasted that Unison seemed to be adopting a different approach from that. So I would ask that the committee agree to write to Unison uh, to explain their position. It seems that totally at conflict with what they have previously said and our experiences at the committee. Mr. Chair, I, I, well, I would. Um, yeah. I, I, I would Go second ahead, that. I'll, uh, I, I would second that, and I would also ask that uh, in that letter that we ask them if the social media post uh, last night published on Facebook was sanctioned uh, by their leadership or indeed their, their health representatives. Uh, and sure, uh, I, I'd like to speak on the, the subject when you permit. Um, so I have Pat Sheehan indicating there as well. Pat, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yes, Chair. Um, I, I, I have no intention of making a row of this, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, I mean, if, uh, if, if the, these British soldiers are, are coming in to help out, uh, it's, it's no real concern of mine. My only concern is that they don't get in the way of the real professionals who are doing the work to, to, to save lives. Um, and I mean, I, I, we have always said that we'll take help from wherever we can get it in in the course of this pandemic. Uh, to be honest, I think this is the slamming the dead cat down on the table to deflect attention away from the inadequacies in the health department at the minute. It's clear that they have no strategy to deal with this pandemic. Uh, and that's the fundamental problem here. As I said earlier on, there's no rescheduling of cancer treatments in Australia, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Vietnam, and so on. But we have to do it here. And we have to do it because we have been hanging on here to the coattails of this completely incompetent and inept British government. Uh, We haven't a strategy of our own in the health department. There hasn't been one developed. And many, many mistakes have been made in the course of this pandemic. And I think it's important that this committee demands of the health department to show us what their strategy is going to be for the next six months to a year, uh, because we're, we're far from out of the woods here yet. Thanks. Okay, and I have an indication then from Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, I want to uh, speak against and vote against the, the proposal from Jonathan. I mean, it's a it is a clear attempt at deflection. Um, I mean, it's quite remarkable that um, you know we thank healthcare workers, we clap for them, and then we've got a member who's trying to maybe two at least trying to wag the finger at them. Um, and I think the the point here being that you know we've failed to see action um, to tackle the fact that there's so many private hospital beds. We've failed to see any action to learn, as sort of Pat indicated, from other countries like New Zealand. We've failed to see zero COVID approach adopted. I mean, the failures are long, there's many of them. And the fact that um, some members want to focus on that, even though there are parties opposed, taking uh, uh, advice based on what scientific and medical advisors were, were warning, they open things up too quickly. It's quite uh, laughable and hypocritical, so I'm strongly against uh, against Jonathan's proposal. Um, I have an indication then from Pam, and then I'll go to Paula. Uh, thank you, Chair. So Pam first. Uh, thank you. Chair, I always look forward oh, to pa- Pat uh, taking Alan, me on it. Alan, sorry, sorry I'll go, Alan, I'll come back to you. I had asked for Pam. Uh, Alan, I had asked sorry, for Pam Cameron, and then Paula, and then I'll come back. Thank You're you, okay. Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Chair. And obviously, I will be uh, supporting the proposal. Um, I have to I have to say, I mean, my office has been inundated on calls from actual Unison members who are horrified by what went out last night. So I think they absolutely do have questions answered on this. Uh, but I'm also um, very horrified by yet again Pat Shane's comments. And when he's just, I, I can't believe he's just said this. He, he, he talked about. Um, military 
getting in the way of real professionals? Is he trying to say that medical professionals from the military are not real professionals? I mean, I think this is absolutely astounding. Once again, uh, from Pat, I'm just, I'm just flabbergasted. I think he needs to withdraw that comment, quite frankly. But I support um, the proposal, the initial proposal. Okay, I'm going across to Paula. Paula, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair. And I don't necessarily want to get embroiled in this argument here today. I think that it's it's actually unnecessary. I was working till nine o'clock last night, and so I didn't actually see the tweet. I don't really care about what the going, comments and goings about that. But I do think that Pat's um, comment around getting in the way of real professionals was crass. It was unnecessary, and I think that it doesn't add to this issue. I think the, there are wider issues around the workforce and the support that we are giving to them to fight this virus, but I think that that was unnecessary, Pat, and I think you should withdraw it as well. Okay, and I'm going then across to Alan. Uh, Alan, go you. ahead, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, as I was saying, I, when we talk in these subjects, I, I always look forward to Pat taking us on a tour uh, of South Asia. Um, now, just in relation to uh, this uh, Facebook post by Unison last night, just to put the thing, uh, uh, my position in perspective, um, I come from a very working class background and my, my politics are steeped in, in fighting for workers' rights. I'm certainly not uh, anti union. But I have to say that the Facebook post that was put out last night in the name of Unison uh, must be quite unique. Yeah. in uh, trade union history, uh, insofar as uh, a union appears to be put out by efforts to actually improve and ease the working condition uh, of their members. And in that post uh, on Facebook, they said that they hadn't been consulted mm -hmm. and that they were uh, going to be in conversation with the chief nursing officer. They were demanding to see information in relation to staffing pressures. Uh, they want full transparency in relation to staff pressures across our hospitals. And they're going to write to the Minister and demand detailed reasons uh, for this decision. Now, surely this union uh, is in a better position than any of us to know exactly what all those pressures are, and they don't need to ask anybody Absolutely. other than uh, the members that they represent. And also, they were calling on staff been brought in from the private sector. I, I thought unions were opposed uh, to that particular manoeuvre. And you know, some people, some people have indicated to me this morning that they think that this was maybe some sort of an anti-army uh, agenda. And the reason why they're saying that is that just a few weeks ago, uh, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service announced that the PSNI and uh, Fire and Rescue Service drivers were coming in to help. And indeed, ambulances from the Republic of Ireland came north uh, to, help, uh, to help out the ambulance service. And I didn't hear the union then registering any complaints or demands for a rationale or looking for evidence of need for those particular manoeuvres been taken. I just want to place on record, I think that the workers in our hospitals should at least be, they should be reassured that the Minister of Health is continually fighting their corner, and he has been since he took up his post. Uh, really, really disappointed uh, with Unison. Uh, and I think that the, the, the second uh, Facebook post that they put out in the early hours of the morning uh, really was it was uh, uh, really pushing damage limitation uh, to the limit and, and, and really the old advice about when you've dug yourself into a hole you should stop digging I think is, is very very relevant uh, to this situation. Thank you Mr Chairman. Okay, thank you, thank you, members, and that that has been a, a wide ranging discussion. I have to say, um, I was, uh, I have to say, rather shocked to find out that that things had got to a stage where that this measure was required, because it's my understanding that 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 process can only be initiated where the requesting party can demonstrate that the that the civil contingency is is at the point of being overwhelmed, and I think there are legitimate questions around a range of workforce issues. Um, in relation to how we have got to this point. Now, I, am, I have become increasingly aware over the past couple of weeks, and actually yesterday, in, in advance of this coming out, I wasn't aware of that at all, but I had actually asked a number of written questions to the minister yesterday 
in relation to the process of return to practice for nurses and also the workforce appeal because it has come to my attention increasingly over the past number of weeks that there are potentially hundreds of experienced nurses of our own nurses out there in our community who have requested to come back into the front line to assist with this pandemic. Some of them have never had their application acknowledged. Some of them have went through an extensive process which involves them at times working for 10 weeks at their own expense, buying their own uniforms, paying for their own vaccinations, and they, they are fully committed and went through that process and have still not been called forward in an emergency situation by our Department of Health. Now, I, it's my understanding that there are experienced ICU nurses, respiratory nurses, nursing consultants, and palliative care nurses who are asking to be brought back, and they have relevant previous experience here. So I do question that element of it, I have to say, and I think that's relevant. It's clear there are, there are concerns from the unions as well in relation to that process and how that is all come about. So what I think we should be considering is, first of all, it's my understanding that Charlotte McCardle, Chief Nursing Officer, made this request. And I think it would be a very, very appropriate that we would ask Charlotte to come and brief the committee on the circumstances that have led to this, uh, to this situation arising, because I think it is a reflection of failure to plan uh, or failure to act uh, quickly on the amount of nurses who are trying to enter the workforce and also people who are trying to become vaccinators to take pressure off frontline health workers. We've seen a similar blockage. Um, so I think initially we should look at speaking to Charlotte McYardle. I'm aware there are issues with BSO, and I think we may need to, to ask them to provide us with an update on the reasons for these blockages. And I think we should, right, it, it's not our role to hold Unison to account in particular, but I think we should maybe write out to all of the unions and ask them for an update from them in relation to their workforces and the pressures they're facing at the present time. So I, I, I think that's something that, that the committee should take note of. And I, I, would, uh, I would ask uh, members, would you agree that we seek a briefing from Charlotte McYardle into this, uh, into this situation and that we also ask the unions to update us with, uh, with their workforce concerns? Sure. Are members content with that? Sure. I, I have no problem in seconding your proposal and writing to uh, the other um, un our unions and indeed to government ministers on this issue. But let's not deflect away from the reality. Absolutely. Because that's what's, that's what's happening here. We need help, wherever that may come. It should come as no shock to Unison, given the fact that at the previous two committees, the minister, when he, was, when he came to the committee, was asked about this, said that if it came a time that he would require their assistance, he would call for it. It's something that has been done right across the United Kingdom. Unison in England welcomed the deployment of the military to help alongside the medical professionals. It's time we take the politics out and act grown up and where the help is needed, let's provide it. So I have no problem in supporting your proposal as well to get those briefings if that is an issue in which you've identified. Yeah. Okay, um, so, so members are, are members content then with that course of action in relation to that? Yep, members are content. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Members. Members. Alan, Alan and my proposal was that uh, where that was agreed, wasn't it? Uh, we, will, my, we, we have agreed that we will ask Charlotte McCarter to brief the committee and that we will write to all unions asking them to update us on their on workforce the, uh, concerns. There's a proposal on the floor, Mr. The Chairman. The there's a proposal Chair, put on the floor the by uh, Jonathan and seconded by myself. Uh, and uh, that has to be discharged, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm quite happy to support the actions, the subsequent actions that you have uh, put forward, but I don't think that you can ignore uh, a proposal that has been put on the floor and seconded by members of this committee. Great. Well, what, what, I, have, what, I, have did, what I have done, Alan, there is I have, I have uh, made a counter proposal that we write to all the unions, including Unison. And no. ask them, ask them to update us. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting that as a counter proposal. No, so, there's a quite specific and, and thought, proposal thought, on the I floor, was... Mr. Chairman, that we write to uh, Unison, uh, and I added uh, yeah. some words okay. to the proposal that Jonathan put on the floor, which That's I correct. presume the clerk will have, uh, will have noted. Okay, well, okay then, we will put that, we will put that proposal that we write, your proposal is we write solely to Unison asking them to explain themselves to the committee, which I feel is... Uh, uh, Mr. Is, Chairman, is, it is not an alternative on, to the proposal that you have on the floor. You're, you're making it out that it's somehow okay. 
this one or that one. It's not the proposal that is on the floor from uh, Mr Buckley and myself is a standalone, and we have both indicated that we will fully support your proposal, the second one, to take the action that you have put on the table. We will fully support that. But we have a, a proposal on the floor now that we would like uh, to be discharged by the, by the committee. Absolutely. Okay, so are members content that we write as proposed by Alan and Jonathan that we write to unison? No, disagree. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Disagree. Okay, okay. There's, 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 there's. Okay, now, so there's. We, we will need to now go to a division. So, um, I, I can just if I if I need to check, clerk, do we need to go into closed session in order to make the arrangements to have a, a vote in public on this? Uh, no, Chair, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, if you ask for the ayes to indicate, I'll record that and then ask for the noes. Chair, Chair. Okay. Yes, Chair, go ahead. No, sorry, it's Paula. Go ahead, Paula. Paula, go ahead, Paula. And Chair is also indicating, but go ahead, Paula. Apologies, Chair. Apologies, Chair. I didn't see your hand. Um, I, I would like you to um, give me the exact warnings. As I indicated earlier, I had a long day yesterday. I didn't see what happened, what was said, or anything like that. So I'm actually quite uneasy about. Um, and uh, as you know, I'm the Alliance, I'm the middle of the road here, so I'm probably going to be the deciding vote, and I'm feeling very uncomfortable not having all the background as to what happened over the last 24 hours to vote on that. So um, if you could give me the exact wording, or if, if the um, clerk could send something out later. But at the minute, I, I, I have to say I'm feeling very uneasy not knowing the background. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to Chara, and I will ask, I will ask Alan then um, to... To either put that into writing, or we can we can defer the vote on this to next week and allow members to have a look at the actual motion. Um, but I'll go to Chiara first of all. Go ahead, yeah, Chiara. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Just to seek um, you know clarification. All right, are we writing to express disappointment, or are we writing to uh, seek clarification? Or uh, I just can't grasp from that aspect what the intention is. Thank yeah. you. Chair, okay. could I clarify what the proposal is from myself yes, go, and, and, a, yeah. and Alan's amendment? Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, we both indicate that we are yes, supportive of both proposals. What I was indicating was that, that the committee asked that we write to Unison to ask them to explain their position. Uh, Alan added to that, and I'll not put words in his mouth, but I, I understand it was around uh, who sanctioned the statement from Unison uh, in relation to their position. If Alan has anything else that's to add, no, I think that's it. it. That's as that simple it. as it is. Yep. It's it's just uh, an explanation from Unison. Okay, Paula, are you clear enough with that for, yeah, to allow think, us to move ahead to vote on it? Yeah, I think it's more of a question than a than a position that the health committee has taken. So I'm happy for you to go ahead and put it to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay. So all those in favour of Jonathan's and Alan's. Uh, Proposal, please indicate now. On the grounds of seeking clarification, yeah. So that's Cara, Paula, Pam. Um, and who do you have in the room, Eilish? Um, we have Jonathan and Alan in the room. So I have Pam, Paula, Jonathan and Cara. I have four eyes. Four eyes. Oh, and Alan. those five, five, those who are against uh, writing to unison for that, ex that explanation as, as proposed by Jonathan, those against. So I'm seeing on the screen, Clark, myself, um, Pat and Jerry Carroll. There's and one of them. I, I, I can't see our Leah. I can't see our Leah's. Our Leah's gone off camera. So I'm not sure what her vote. Can you hear me, Chair? Her hand's raised. Yes, yes, Orly, I can hear you. My camera's not working. My battery's running down low, so my camera's turned off. But yes, my hand's raised. Your hand is raised in opposition to the motion from Jonathan and, and Alan. Yeah. Yes. So we have we have on screen then a uh, clerk, myself, Pat, Jerry, and Orlea. Um, do you have anyone then in the room? We have uh, no one in the room voting against. We have five in favour and four against. So the motion is carried. Okay, okay. So that that motion is carried. Um, my 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 proposal then was that we write to all of the unions and ask them to give us an update with their agreed. workforce pressures and concerns at the present time. Agreed. Our agreed. members agreed with that. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Agreed, chair. Thank you, members. Thank you, members. And also, um, 
could we also uh, can can we agree that we will ask Charlotte McCardle to brief the committee on the workforce situation at present, and and uh, that we will seek a, a briefing from the chief nursing officer in relation to that? Are we agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, members. Yep. Yeah, thank sure. thank you, members, for that. Um, I will now move on to date, time, and place of next yeah. meeting, if that's okay. Yes, Pam, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to come back. I just think you should be given uh, Pat an opportunity if he wants to withdraw his comments. And it's in particular in well, relation I, to I'm... in particular to in relation to saying that the military personnel coming in to assist were not real professionals. I think it's very, very offensive, and I think he should withdraw it. I know Paula said the same, and I. I think you should give him the opportunity to do so if he, if he wants to. Pat, have you anything further you wish to add? No, sir. Okay. Okay. Um, thank, thank, you, thank you, members. Um, so I'm moving on then to date, time and place of next meeting. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, the 20th of January at 9.30 a.m. in the Senate Chamber. Thank you, members, and please take care as always. Thank you. Assembly Al Moore. Senate Chamber Thank you. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.